Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It is said, and truly said, that who plays with fire is sure to get burned. It is also said, and truly said, that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Seems to me there's another one, too. Oh, yes, the mills of the gods grind slow, but grind exceeding fine. Those of us who, through living, learn the underlying truth in these proverbs, take care not to play with fire to sow carefully and to give as little grist as possible to those grinding mills. Not so Kay Wiley. Devil may care, fun-loving Kay Wiley. You... You're going to kill me. Come on now, sweetie. What makes you think that? What other reason would you have for luring me here? Who lured you? You wanted to come? Wanted to be alone with me? Didn't you? No, I... Yeah, I don't know. I do, sweetie. Your trouble is you can't make up your mind. Well, let me make it up for you. No. No! Our mystery drama, Death on Skis, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Rosemary Murphy and Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and imported Vigna Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You're driving a car you knew you were going to buy the minute you saw it. Skyhawk. Buick Skyhawk. You just knew a car this streamlined would be easy on gas, and you were right. In published EPA mileage test results, Skyhawk got 25 miles per gallon on the open road and 16 in the city. Skyhawk. It's rakish, it's low slung, it looks European, but it's a Buick. Living free. certain immutable laws in this world of ours, and one of them is that we, all of us, must sooner or later pay the piper. 
A simple law, easy to understand, not too difficult to obey, really. And yet there are a good many who never seem to understand it, and rarely, if ever, obey it, until too late. Kay Wiley, wife of Dan Wiley, the novelist, was one of these. Gay, irresponsible, fun gal Kay, who let the piper play on and on till the day he presented his bill. Well, what do you say, you two? Shall we ski back down to the inn? The murder scene getting on your nerves, Dan. <laughs> and you a mystery writer? <laughs> a writer who has to get his latest manuscript off to his publisher in New York by tomorrow. Now, look. I said I'd take the time to show you both the scene of the murder, and I have. I've gone out of my way to ski way the hell and gone up to the top of the mountain to this hut where the two murders took place. Now, the least you can do... The least you can do is stop acting like a husband and let me enjoy myself. Well, for Pete's sake, what's to enjoy? A lonely, isolated hut on top of a mountain. Where two women, not one, but two, and both of them blondes, like me, were slashed to death. One last year, one the year before last. Gives me goosebumps just being here. Delicious goosebumps. More thrill-making than even one of your novels, darling. Well, now that you've had your thrill... Well, let her finish it, Toddy, Dan. Do me a favor, Tony. Stop interfering between Kay and me. After all, she is my wife, you know, though you seem to forget that often enough. Well, meaning what, Dan? Now, you know what I mean. Well, I'm afraid I don't. You better explain that crack. Oh, come on now. Let's not spoil it. Dan, let's you and me get something straight. I've enjoyed being with Kay ever since I met you two last week. Now, like you say, it's a working vacation for you, and you've been holed up in your room with that typewriter of yours most of the time. While you and Kay have piled around together and had a few laughs together. And that's all. Not that there couldn't have been more. Kay's very attractive and just the kind that turns me on, but uh, we've just had one big laugh together, Dan, and that is all. You know it is, darling. Yes, yes, of course I do. Okay. I, uh... Well, I, I... Skip it. Let's get back down to the inn. <sighs> Woohoo! Hey, hey, it's turned real cold all of a sudden. Sun's going down. I better take the south slope. It's shorter. Uh-uh. We'll go down the way we came up. It's safer. Dan, I'm getting cold already. Oh, blast the sun. Yes, we can let me caught to it. Oh, sure, sure. Dan, the south slope, it isn't really dangerous. It's risky. It's too risky for you, darling. Even Hornbach warned you about it. Stuffy, old Norwegian. Hornbach isn't stuffy and he isn't old. Unless you call 42 old, he knows these mountains better than anyone. And he's one of the best pros around. So you listen to what he tells you. There you are. You're all set. Last one back at the inn. Buys the hot potty. Okay, I said not the south slope. Stop worrying, darling. I'll be okay. I'm right along. Tell her not to do something, and you can bet on her doing it. <laughs> There's no harm in her, Dad. She just likes to do her own thing. Yes. And one day... One day what? She may do it once too often. Dan? Dan? Okay, please... I'm trying to finish this last chapter. Last two pages, in fact. We're nearly an hour late for dinner already. Well, you go on. Well, go ahead. No, not after this afternoon. What this afternoon? Tony will see me alone at our table, and he'll come over Well, what if he and... Oh, oh, I get it. Kay, I'm sorry. I know, I know there's nothing between you and Tony. You didn't sound that way up at the heart. Yes, I know, but... But what? Dan, we've been married nearly three years... I was 23, you were 38. I didn't think the difference in age mattered. You didn't either then. But now, is it beginning to? I don't know, dear. Somehow I seem to get older while you get younger. I'm not getting any younger. Well, you certainly don't act any older. You're as reckless and as irresponsible as, uh, as, uh, what's the word I want? Spoiled? Childish? Will that do? Yes, I guess so. Now, taking the south slope this afternoon, for instance, Kay, you could have been killed. But I wasn't. I was never more alive coming down that slope. To me, life is a dare, a risk. Unless you take the risks, you never really live. Hmm. Well, there's something in that. But you can't go too far, Kay. You did this afternoon. You did a year ago when I came here to finish my last Minerva Twine mystery and left you in New York. So the horse didn't clear the jump. Well, you didn't have to take that higher jump. Now, you could have broken your neck instead of your collarbone. 
And, and what about the year before that? I came out here to finish another novel, and you... I know, and I'd never parachuted before, and it is a new sport, Dan. Yes, and when Sandy Darling dared you to try it, you had to take the dare. Busted an ankle that time. <laughs> I guess from here on, you're saddled with bringing me along when you come here to finish a book. Well, what do you think I brought you this time? Oh, Dan, darling, am I more trouble than I'm worth? <sighs> well, you're trouble, all right, but you're worth it. No, be serious now. You've been coming here the last two years alone, so you could be alone and finish a book without any interruptions. Have I ruined that for you? Because if I have... Don't be silly. It's been wonderful having you with me, Kay. And see, less than two pages to the end. I'll mail the finished manuscript off tomorrow, right on schedule. And then, sweetheart, the handsome Tony Shaw will have to find another playmate. Because I'll be your playmate from then on. Oh, Dan, I love you so. Well, just build that up into adoration. Then we'll start even. Now, come on, dinner. Indian Wells, Dan, all the way to Indian Wells just to mail a manuscript? What do you mean, just? to mail a manuscript. It's Dan Wiley's latest Minerva Twine mystery. Yes, but the round trip to Indian Wells, it takes at least half a day. Why not mail it from the end here? Well, that's too chancy, Tony. Indian Wells is a good-sized town with a good-sized post office. And they... Oh, Otto, Otto Hornbach, come and join us for coffee. No, I thank you. Oh, come on, sit down. I said no. Well, what's happened to our jovial ski pro? Something soured you, Otto? I know what soured him. You heard about me taking the south slope this afternoon, didn't you, Otto? After I warned you, you weren't ready for anything that steep yet? I suppose he put you up to it? Tony? Him and his practical joke. Oh, ye gods, Otto. That was two years ago. You're still holding that against me? It wasn't funny, and I don't forget easy, Tony. Tony, what did you do to Otto? Oh, he was giving me a lesson. I fell. Well, I pretended I busted my leg. How do you act as if I'd broken my spine? Accidents are no joke. Not to me. I, I see too many. I do not like practical jokes. And, Mrs. Wiley, I do not like people to ignore my warnings. Otto, I'm sorry. Sorry is not enough. I warned you, but you went ahead anyway, and you could have killed yourself. Like Mrs. Horner killed herself last year, and Miss Yates the year before that. Killed themselves? They were killed, Otto. They were murdered. I say they killed themselves. I warned them. When you ski alone, I said to each of them, I said it. More than once I said it. When you ski alone by yourself, stay close to the end. Do not go far off. So if you have an accident, no one will know till maybe too late. The hut is far at the top of a mountain. Yes, and if we have a sudden blizzard, almost impossible to reach. But they did not heed any warning. Like you, Mrs. Wiley. Ah, sometimes I think all you young women are the same, heedless, reckless, spoiled know-it-all. Hey, 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 Otto, take it easy. You're, you're talking to my wife. Yeah, the way you should talk to her, maybe. Now, look, Otto. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I, I apologize, but I... Well, I get upset when people ignore my warnings. Excuse me now. <sighs> well, he's really ticked off at you, Kay. At me, too. Well, maybe I can't blame him. That practical joke of mine, I guess I went too far... Listen, you two, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll go and buy him a drink. Bury the hatchet. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'll see you. <sighs> Otto's right, you know, Kay. So do me a favor, will you? You have but to command me, Matt. No, seriously. I'll be gone all afternoon tomorrow, and I want you to stay close to the inn. Above all, don't go near that hut. The scene of the crime? Or should I say crimes? Why not? Just... Don't, that's all. Dan, you do sound serious. I am, very serious. But why? But, oh, I know, the murders, those two gals hacked and slashed to death. They happened just about this time of year, didn't they? Yes. And you think another murder? It's possible. They never caught the murderer, you know. He's still on the loose. Okay, oh, listen, but... listen to me for once. I have a theory about these murders. I'm probably wrong, but if I just happen to be right... Another murder could take place up there in that hut. And it could take place tomorrow. Tomorrow? What gives you that idea? Never mind. Just do as I ask you, will you? To stay close to the inn. And above all, stay away from that hut. <laughs> you sort of made me want to go up there now. What? Oh. Yes, of course. Warn you not to do something and you're almost compelled to do it, aren't you? Ah. Uh -huh. Maybe that's why you warned me. What? So I will go. And who will be waiting for me there with a big, sharp knife? But you... Kay. Well, 
Well, didn't something like that happen in one of your mysteries? The one where the loving husband lured his wife into a trap and murdered her? <laughs> you know, Kitty, or something else. There's only one place I've ever wanted to lure you. Where? Well, you know where. <laughs> Come on, finish your coffee. And fast. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Otto wasn't right last night. Otto? Right about what? Oh, about skiers getting caught up here on top of the mountain in a sudden blizzard. I'd say there's one coming from the look of those clouds out there and the force of the wind. Not to worry. If it's not snowing, we'll start right back down. On the south slope, no doubt. No doubt. How about opening the thermos and letting me have a hot toddy? I can use it. Oh, me too. Just being in this hut is enough to chill you. Because a couple of murders were done here? That scares you? Oh, I didn't say me. I said you. It doesn't scare me. Well, maybe it ought to. Here, hot toddy. Thanks. Why? Hmm? Why ought it to scare me? Well, you told me uh, Dan warned you not to come up here to the hut while he was away. Right? Right. Because he thought another murder, murder number three, could take place today? Right? Right. Well... Could be Dan knows something we don't know. Could be another woman, another blonde, is going to be slashed to death today. <laughs> Me? You. Oh, what have I got to worry about? I'm with you. Precisely. What? I said precisely. You're here alone, far from the inn, in a hut that's been the scene of two murders, each at this time of the year. And you're here because a man you scarcely know, me, dared you to come. As I said earlier, the piper must always be paid. I can't help wondering if Kay's piper isn't asking for payment now. Payment in full. I'll return shortly for Act Two. <laughs> is really killing me just sitting here by the radio with Vina Rosie Wall. Vina Rosie Wall? Say this Vina Rosie's delicious. It goes with so many dishes. Or all alone by the radio. Vina Rosie Wine. Vina Rosie Wine. Come let me pour you some more Vina at the prices of value. Know what I mean, yeah. Now let's go back to our mystery show. But I have one question before I go. What's light and refreshing imported to? Vina Rose Wine. That's the answer. Vina Rose Wine. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What a wine. Imported by Dude Lime, Hartford, Connecticut. finds herself in what well may be a murderous situation, which is to say, she may be murdered in a matter of minutes or less. Ignoring the warning of her husband, mystery novelist Dan Wiley, she has blithely gone off with Tony Shaw, a man she scarcely knows, to an isolated mountain hut where two murders have already taken place. To judge from the look on Kay's face, Tony is speaking the truth. When he says... Let me give you a refill on that toddy, Kay. You look as if you could use it. You're not the murderer. How do you know? Oh, come on now, Tony. No, 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 seriously. How do you know? <laughs> really, Tony. If you expect me to fall for one of your silly practical jokes... I'm not joking, Kay. This is for real. Uh, Tony, you're going too far. A joke is a joke, but... Pulling a knife on me. Pulling a knife? Me? Oh, no, no, no. Just showing it to you, Kay. You've seen it before. Always carry it with me. Comes in handy now and then. Like, uh, well, when I used it to repair that strap on your ski boat the other day. 
I remember, yes. So, uh, don't jump to conclusions about me pulling a knife on you. Oh, I could be, couldn't I? Tony, if you don't stop this nonsense... I could. Couldn't I? Yes. I I guess you could, except... Except what? You'd be crazy. Kill me and you'd never get away with it. No? Why not? Well, they know. Back at the inn, they know I came up here with you. They do? Well, anyhow, that we went skiing together. How do they know that? (laughs) It's coming back to you now, isn't it? You told me to go on ahead. That you'd meet me at the bottom of the trail. They don't know I'm up here with you. They, They don't even know we're together. Exactly. So now you see the spot you could have put yourself in. You could be dead right now. Murdered. Slashed to ribbons. The way the other two were. What? I I don't understand. I'm no murderer, Kay. Then why have you pretended? I haven't pretended anything. No practical joke either, if that's what you're thinking. All I've done is open your eyes to the spot you might have got yourself into through foolishness. Foolishness? All right, childishness. Indifference to what serious consequences could result from your anything-for-a-thrill attitude. Now you sound like Dan. Oh? Well, you know, he's forever warning me that sooner or later I'll take one day or too many. And you could have this time. No, I didn't. You may yet. Look, Tony, enough is enough. Now, let me tell you who I really am. I'm not the practical joking ski bum I pretend to be. I'm a security officer. Security officer? I'm kind of detective. In fact, I have my own agency back in San Francisco. I don't understand. Well, just listen to me and you will. Back two years ago, after the first murder took place, the inn management hired me to find the killer. You? Why you? What about the local police? Oh, the local cops are a laugh. It's just a sheriff and his deputy. The Indian Wells police came up with nothing. So they called me in. The management of the inn, I mean. And I'm afraid I blew it last season. The second murder was done right under my nose. But not this season. No, no. This time I'm just a few steps ahead of the killer. And that's where you come in. And where exactly is that, Sherlock? You're the bait. Oh, no. Not little Kay Wiley. Oh, yes. You're marked for death no matter where you are. Sooner or later, the man who murdered those two blondes in this hut is going to murder you. You you sound as if you know who he is. I'm pretty sure I do. Who? Your husband, Dan Wiley. Tony, you're crazy. I wish I were. Dan's in Indian Wells. Right now in Indian Wells, mailing a... No? No. I could be wrong. But if I'm right... He never went to Indian Wells. Dan! Dan Wiley! What are you doing out here on ski? I thought you had gone to Indian Wells. Uh, no. No, Otto, I... But uh... I saw you leave an hour ago. Drive off in your car. I changed my mind. I was going to mail a manuscript to my publisher, but... Halfway to Indian Wells, would you believe it, Otto? I suddenly thought of a different ending. And a better one. Ah, this means you have to sit and write a whole new end? Yes, I'm afraid so. Oh, me, I would never be a writer. They work too hard. Ah, you better believe it. <laughs> See my wife, Otto? Uh, she went off skiing not long after you left. Oh, anybody with her? No, she went by herself. And I tell you this, I warned her again to stay off the south slope. Oh, well, you can save your breath, Otto. I know, I know. I'm telling you, lay down the law before it is too late. Show her who is boss, who wears the pants. Oh, it's nothing like that. Kay isn't bossy. She doesn't try to wear the pants or anything like that. She's just... Well, she's just young and exuberant. You can tell Kay not to do something and you bet she'll do it. Huh. Obstinate. No, just... I don't know, more like, uh, more like a child. Do you, uh, know where she is right now? I told you I don't know. Oh. Well, I'd be willing to bet she's up at the hut, the murder hut. Why would you bet on that? Because I told her not to go there while I was away in Indian Wells. Ah, so you think she went? I'm practically sure she did. Ah, I will never understand women, never. No, me neither. Well, I'll see you, Otto. Uh, you going to meet your wife up at the hut? Uh-uh. No, I'm going to meet a typewriter in my room. So long, so long. No, no wait, Dan! Ah, uh, ah. Uh, he didn't hear me this wind. It's funny, though. 
if he knew she would go to the hut when he told her to stay away from it? Huh. It's funny. Which is why he deliberately warned you to stay away from here. So I'd come here? What kind of sense does that make? Okay, you all right? Yes. You've kind of knocked the breath out of me, Tony. I, I, I still can't believe... But you're right. Everything you've said is so true. In the few years we've been married, I... I never have got to know him. Not really know him. He's married to that typewriter of his more than to me. And yes, he did come here last year and the year before without me. Said he had to be alone to finish a novel. But this time he brought you along. Why? Did you insist? No, I'd never think of interfering with his work. No, he he asked me to come. And when I said maybe it would be better if I didn't, he insisted. Figures. But uh, I just can't believe... If I'm right, if Dan is a murderer, he'll show up here in a few minutes. And I don't want to be here when he does. All right, then, let's go. But, uh... Tony, I just can't believe this of Dan, and I'm not going to. As I said, I I haven't got to know him as well as I'd like, but good Lord, you can't be married to a man for nearly three years without knowing that he isn't a killer. And that's one thing Dan is not. I'd stake my life on it. That's exactly what you're going to do. What do you mean? I'm leaving, but you're staying here. Tony! He didn't go to Indian Wells. I'm positive he didn't. He knows you're here because he made a point of warning you not to come here. Now, look, you've got nothing to worry about. I won't be far, just up in that stand of cottonwoods. They won't see me, but I'll see him when he arrives. And then what? When he makes his move, I'll make mine. I'll be right outside that door when he makes it. What you're saying is when he attacks me with a knife. Exactly. Tony, I can't go through with this. You've I... got to if you want to help me catch him. I don't want to help you catch him. I, I, I mean... Oh, I don't know what I mean. He's my husband. I love him. I can't believe he's a murderer. Well, then you've got nothing to fear, have you? If I'm wrong and you're right, nothing will happen. Not a thing. But if it's the other way around... Well, then I think this time you'll get a thrill to end all thrills. I can't believe this is happening. Believe me, it is. Okay, I'm off. No, Tony, please, no. Come on now, Kay. I can't do this. I'm scared to death, Tony. If you don't believe Dan's the killer... I'd be a fool not to realize the things you've said are true. Tony, don't leave me, please. Please. Well, I guess I had you taped all wrong. What do you mean? Kay Wiley, who dare anything. Kay Wiley, who parachuted from a plane on a dare, jumped a horse over the highest hurdle. Oh, yes, I heard all about that. I saw you make the south slope on skis yesterday. Yes, I've taken some dares again and again because... Because... Yes, because what? Because I was afraid. Afraid? Petrified. Tony, I'm the worst coward in the world. The daring Kay Wiley is a mask, a front. I forced myself to take dares just so I, I could prove to myself that I'm not a coward. But underneath, I am... And, Tony, this is one day I can't take. I promise you I'll be right outside waiting. If you don't take the dare, if you refuse to stay here and face him, you'll never know, will you? No. Whether he's a murderer or isn't. Oh, Dan. What is it? There's somebody coming up the trail. Dan? I can't tell. Snow blurs everything. But it's got to be him. Now, look, will you stay? I... uh... I... You've got no choice. You've got to find out. You've got to have the nerve to find out. All right, I'll see you. Tony! Oh, no. Dan. Hello, Kay. Imagine Kay's feelings as Dan Wiley enters the hut, proving Tony right. A curious situation. A woman facing the man she loves, her husband, not sure if he's a murderer. Certainly looks as if he is. And yet, well, we'll learn more when I return for Act Three. You're on the open road. 
thrilling, free, and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. mid-sized car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Your Century's comfortable, it's nimble, it's economical, and above all, it's a Buick. Living free. Here's a riddle. Name a giant that lives in the ocean but can't breathe underwater. A giant that sings songs but has no vocal cords. Give up? It's a whale. One of the most fascinating giants that ever lived. And what's more, these giants have enormous brains and impressive intelligence. Let's use some of ours to save them from extinction. A message from the National Audubon Society and its local chapters. Hi, Carmelita Pope with great news from Magicist. This is the time of year for Magicist once a year two for one sale. Now you can have two rugs clean for the price of one. You can have two rooms of carpeting clean for the price of one. You can have two pieces of upholstered furniture or two pairs of draperies clean for the price of one. The Magicist service and quality during the sale is as professional as ever. The only change is two for one prices. Stop in or call Magicist for details. This is a limited offer. We're always loaded with work during the sale. We don't want to disappoint anyone. Chicago phones call 378-8600. That's 378-8600. Suburbs see your phone book. Master Charge and Bank Americard are welcome. The 20% cash and carry discount also applies even with a two-for-one sale in effect. Come clean with Magic Kiss and get your whole house Magic Kiss clean. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. The correct time, 1106. 31 degrees at Midway, 31 at the Loop and Lake Front. A warm night for February. What would you do? How would you feel? Your husband, the man you love, stands before you and, for all you know, has come to kill you. Indeed, cleverly lured you into a trap. Surely you'd be torn with uncertainty caught between love and fear, and underneath these emotions would writhe despair. For if he is your killer, this man you love, you just as soon be dead anyway. I thought I'd find you here, Kay. I know. You know? I'm not totally naive, Dan. You knew when you warned me not to come that I would. Well, why the devil would I figure you would come when I begged you not to? Because... I'm like the victim in your last novel, Death is a Blonde. You based that character on me, didn't you? I was the model for her. Okay. Okay, so what of it? Her husband knew she had a contradictory streak in her. I even remember the words you used to describe her. Contrary, as wayward as a child. And he used it to lure her to her death. Okay, things like that happen in novels, not real life. So you're not implying that I lured you here... To kill you. Is that what you're saying? You said you were going to Indian Wells. What are you doing here? Well, to be honest about it, I had no intention of going to Indian Wells. I told you that, and I spread the story around the inn to throw the murderer off my track. So the... Yes. I have a feeling he knows I suspect him. But I also know he strikes when the moon turns full. Okay, I'm all but sure he's a... Homicidal maniac who has to kill. He can't help himself, you see, when the moon turns full this month of the year. You've got to be out of your mind. Maniacs who have to kill because of a full moon? That only happens in novels. Oh, no, no, no. In real life, Kay. You see, the full moon has a powerful effect on people, on the world, if it comes to that. Right now, it's only three in the afternoon. There isn't any moon at all. Kay, Kay, sweetheart, you can't see it, but it's there. And according to the lunar tables, it turned full about five minutes ago. That's why I didn't want you to come here this afternoon. Now, coming here, you set yourself up for the kill played right into the murderer's hands. What if I hadn't ignored your warning, hadn't come here? Well, he'd have tried to lure you here. You or some other blonde at the inn. Blonde? Yes, both previous victims have been blondes. And I'm sure the third will be, too. You seem awfully sure. Yes, I am. I'm very sure. And wait, you're looking at me. Okay, you do think I'm the killer, don't you? No, I... Yes, you do. I can see it in your eyes. You're afraid of me. 
Good Lord, Kay, how can you be? After nearly three years of marriage, three years of living with me, how can you be? And don't pull away. I don't know you. That's the trouble. I, I don't know you at all. What in places are you saying? Don't. Please, don't come near me. I, I am afraid of you. I don't want to be. It, it almost makes me ashamed because I love you and I want to trust you and should trust you, but... But you don't. <sighs> Why not? Have I ever given you reason to distrust me? Why did you come here alone last year and the year before? Well, you know why. I know what you told me. That it was always a habit of yours before we were married. A habit to go off by yourself to finish a novel. Well, it is. Then why did you bring me along this time? Because you begged me to let you come along and I finally gave in. What other reason would... Oh, wait a minute. Now I begin to see why you think... Yes, of course, that's it. I was here last year when the second murder took place and the year before that when the first blonde got it. It isn't that, not that alone. And what? I just don't know you. All day long, for three years, all day long, you've been in your office. Working. And half the night. I can't stop when it's going good. I know that, but it's kept us apart, keeps us apart, and that's why I don't know you and don't know what I've been told is true or not. Whether you didn't go to Indian Wells for the reason you said, or, or another. What is it? You said, I don't know if what I've been told is true or not. Told what? By whom? I, Did you uh, ever come here with someone? Otto? Otto Hornbach. Yes, I talked to him half an hour ago. He said, he said you'd gone off on your own. Yes. Yes, I did. What, did you meet anyone on your way up here? Oh, I know. I... Hey, this is serious. Stan, you're hurting me. Then answer me. Did you meet someone? Did you come here with someone else? Yes. Tony Shaw. Damn it, was it Tony? Yes. Where is he now? You've got a gun. I'd be a fool to go hunting a killer without one. Now, where is he? Right behind Howard. you. Don't move. There's a gun in your back. Drop yours now. All right, pick it up, Kay. Yeah, don't do it, Dan. Don't turn. All right, let me have it, Kay. Thank you. Now you can turn around, Dan. A knife. The end of the handle stuck in your back. You fell for one of the oldest tricks in the book, and you were a mystery story writer. Well, at least I was right about you. Right about me? Look, I'll make a deal with you, Tony. Let Kay go. Kill me instead. Tony? Tony's the murderer? Oh, he's trying to pull the wool over your eyes, sweetie. You're no ski bum, Tony. You've been acting a part, and you're a lousy actor. He's a security officer at the inn, he says. Yes, a security officer who carries a knife, huh? Now I'll tell one. Slashed to death, those women both slashed. Now, don't get all psyched up. The knife's a tool, not a weapon. I've never needed a gun. Well, you seem to need one now. Precaution, that's all. I can handle you with both hands tied behind my back. You know Black Belt. Oh, really? Then suppose we just find out about it. <laughs> Drop it! Drop it! Ah, I'll break your arm! I Drop know. it! I... Get it, Kay. I got it. All right. I'm sorry, Tony. I'll take the gun now, Kay. Kay? No. What? I... I don't know which of you to trust now. I'm sorry, Dan. So am I, honey. I don't blame you. Everything you said, you were right. Maybe you just... Should have said it sooner. You were always too busy. Yes, I guess I was. I guess. Hello! Hello, the heart! Otto! Otto Hornbach! Oh, thank God! Otto! What, what is this? Take this. Take it. What? A gun? Just holding it scares me. Take it. Take it. All right. All right. Come. Come inside. What? What is going on here? I, I don't know. I'm so confused. Tony. Stop. Dan. What has happened? Well, to give it to you straight, Otto, I've got reason to think Tony Shaw is the man who murdered two women in this hut and was bent on murdering a third. Kay. Now, he's a liar, Otto. He's the killer, not me. Oh, how could that be? For one thing, he pretended he was going to Indian Wells today. Oh, I know. I know that. Like, I also know you are not a guest here. You are a detective. You know that? How? Why, look at the files in the office. I see you are on the payroll. And why? And as for you, Dan... Last year and the year before, you mailed your manuscript from the inn. But this year, for no good reason, you have to go to Indian Wells. <laughs> that story you told me about another ending to your novel. Oh, I'm not a fool, Dan. I wasn't born yesterday. 
As for either one of you being the murderer, you can't be. I am. You? Me. And you, my next victim. Almost from the first day you came, my next victim. Why? Because you are like she was, my Helga. <laughs> oh, she put me through a hell on earth. She must have her way, not mine. Do always what she wanted, not what I wanted. She, she came first, me second. I didn't matter. Our okay isn't like they that. all are. Her kind, they're always, you know, they are always small and blonde. Huh? Helpless, dependent, in need of your strength. <laughs> At first, you're, you're taken in. Poor little thing, so helpless, so dependent on you, so in need of your strength, your masculine strength. So you, you give it a little here, a little there, and gradually, so gradually, you don't know it is happening. You, you give her all your strength, and there's none left for you. You are Caught. You are trapped in a web you thought was made of love, but is, is really made of, 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 of what? Of, of, of ego. That's what they call it. Ego. The, the I. The I of I am this and I want that and nobody matters but me. Oh, oh, oh. Leave him alone. Let him talk it out. You, you are Helga. Me? Oh, not just you. At the end, they are Helgas all the time. At least three or four each season. Spoiled, determined, pampered, coddled by fools. The husbands they are destroying as Helga destroyed me. Me. Or, or nearly did. I I woke up in time and, and destroyed her. <sighs> With a knife, Otto? It was handy in the kitchen and happened. And I I loved her. Even even when I was killing her and driving the knife home again and again. I I loved her. Isn't isn't that strange? You see? So now now I I I must kill you, like Mrs. Horner last year, and Miss Yates the year before that, kill you, you see, to save him. Otto, Otto, I don't need saving. Dan, you can't handle this. Neither can Tony. Only a woman can handle this, if it can be handled. You see, you hear what she says. Only a woman can handle it, oh, Spoiled, spoiled, rotten. No, Otto, scared. <laughs> scared, rotten. The way Helga was, and Mrs. Horner, and Miss Yates. Scared? Mrs. Horner? Miss Yates? You? And Helga. Oh, no. No, that is not so. She had me trapped. Because she was afraid of what would happen if she didn't trap you. Otto, she trapped you because she loved you and was afraid. Afraid she might lose you. Lose me? To... To who lose me? Another woman. Another? But, oh, there, there were no other women. There are always other women. Which of you first? No, I'm wait. sorry, but you must die before I kill her. Not witnesses. I cannot have witnesses. For God's sake, Otto, didn't you hear what Kay said? She just told you a simple truth, a simple womanly truth. A woman traps a man because she loves him. And she's scared to death of losing no, she him. She lies. Like all women, she lies. All right, which... Which one first, huh? Tony? Dan? Me. Hey, what in places he I'm do? between you now. Between him and you. He'll have to shoot me first. When he does, jump him. And I thought you said you had no nerve. Get out of the way. Hey, please. Jump him when he fires. Well, go on, Otto. Shoot. Get out of the way. You, you, I must kill with the knife. Sorry, change of plan. A gun this time, Otto. A gun or nothing. Give it to me. Or shoot. Another step. One more and I kill you. You're going to kill me anyhow, so what have I got to lose? Give me that gun. No, wait, wait. What? Okay. Okay, it works both ways. Now get out of his way. Let him shoot us first. That'll give you a second or two to get out that door. And leave you here, dead? Do you think I'd want to go on living? Out of the gun. You... You... You mean it? You mean what you say? Of course I mean it. Why else would I... But I... I don't understand. You... You would give... 
your life to to save his? No. Oh, no. This is not possible. Women are... Oh, no, they are selfish. They come first. Always they come first. All of them. Not all, Otto. Not every woman is like your Helga must have been. I... I was wrong about Miss... Miss Yates, Mrs. Horner. I don't know about them, but you're certainly wrong about me. Wrong? wrong. Oh, no! Hey, no! No! no. Uh, oh, my God. Kay. Kay? I, I'm all right. Better see to him. Oh, crazy, crazy. He shot himself. Dennis, no, no, he's breathing. Now we better get him down to the end fast. I'll give you a hand. Okay, okay, sweetheart. You saved our lives. Believe me, from here on, you can take all the dares you want, and I won't say a word. You won't have to, Dan. There aren't going to be any more. I just took my last. <laughs> Luckily, though, Kay Wiley paid the piper, as must we all. The price was not exorbitant. Her life. You ask me, she got off easily. How about you? You building up a debt you'll have to settle one day with your piper? Better do a little thinking about that. Better do a little thinking myself. I'll be back shortly. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign-off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take sign-off tablets. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. The sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sign-off. The sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And Sinoff doesn't stop there. Have you tried Sinoff Sinus Spray, the fastest known form of sinus congestion relief? It works in seconds. That's Sinoff Sinus Spray. When sinus flares up, use Sinoff tablets and spray only as directed. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. Sinoff. Exactly. Sinoff, the sinus medicines in the bright red box. you'll want to know, lives comfortably today in a rest home. Tony Shaw is back in San Francisco. As for Dan and Kay Wiley, well, Kay doesn't take any dares anymore. She's much too busy bringing up the twins. Dan continues to be a very successful writer of mysteries. Incidentally, you needn't bother to buy his latest Minerva Twine mystery. You just heard it dramatized. cast included Rosemary Harris, Larry Haynes, Ralph Bell, and Norman Rose. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. preview of our next tale. Scorpio, this is a bad day for you. Your sudden death is imminent? Be sure to put all your affairs in order. You cannot escape the inevitability of the stars. It is a hard prediction to face, but it can only be justified out of what you've done to deserve it. Damn, are they out of their minds? That shaky little mouse, Ethel, writing a bomb like this... She'll have scared 25,000 people out of their wits. Uh, this is Amanda Amherst. Put me through to the managing editor. Oh, come on, come on. Adam, it's Amanda. I want the presses stopped. Hold all deliveries and do everything you can to get our first run off the stands. Why? 
Just read Ethel Nixon's column for today and you'll see. I'm on my way down there now, and when I find out what's going on, heads are going to roll, and brother, none of them will be mine. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Chief of True Detective Magazine bringing you the case history of an actual crime. I'm sure that you've often heard the expression crime classic. To be honest with you, I don't know exactly what that phrase means. But if you take it to mean that there are a few criminal cases so outstanding as to become famous, then I can safely say that today's case, which I call The Dream of Richard Lauber, is a crime classic. It started on Gertrude Schmidt's day off, which she spent on the numerous speeches outside the that yacht out there is a pretty sight, isn't it? Yes, it is. But you, you're even prettier. That's a pretty compliment, but I shouldn't listen. I don't know you. If that's all that troubles you, I can take care of it immediately. My name is Joseph Strasser, and I'm an architect. <laughs> oh, not so fast, not so fast. Oh, you're right. We should sit down somewhere where it's cool and comfortable and get to know each other. Oh, I don't think so. That... Oh, come along. It's such a beautiful day. There's no harm in a cold drink. My name is Gertrude Schmidt. And I want to have a cold drink with you. Good. We should be friends. We both come from Germany. You too? Oh, yes. I came here when I was very young, but I've always wanted to go back. My father didn't want me to come here. He said I should stay home and settle down and get married. But I had other ideas. But you certainly believe in marriage. With the right man? <laughs> what woman doesn't? But you haven't met the right man yet. Not yet. At least. Perhaps you have met the right man today. You always talk this way to girls you just met? No, only to you, because we're going to see a lot of each other. Oh, my glass, it's about time. That's a fine greeting. Look at you, look at your stockings. Don't I give you enough money to dress decently? I'd rather you made me poorer than the husband of a flatter. Hold your tongue. You have your nerve coming here at 10 o'clock, leaving me to take care of the children and keep your supper warm for you since six. How do I know where you've been? I was a fool to marry you. So you were a fool to marry me. I'll beat you until... What's stopping you? Uh, give me my supper and stay out of my sight. This is John Shuttleworth again. You wouldn't have recognized Richard Lawler as he wined and dined Gertrude Schmidt in New York's swankiest restaurant and for his long walks with her in the country. He was again using the name of Joseph Strasser. 
He was a carefree bachelor, charming, talking of marriage. Oh, in a moment, we shall hear the path down which Lauber was to plunge with terrifying speed. But first, it's time for O. Henry. Say, Jane, you look like the picture of anxiety today. You leave your car in front of a fire plug? Nope, but I've got Christmas shopping worries. We're sort of short on Christmas tree ornaments, and I'm afraid the shops will be sold out before we get there. Well, don't let that worry you, Jane. Just stop at a candy counter or candy machine on your way home and stock up on O'Henry candy bars. Those O'Henrys look mighty good hanging on a Christmas tree, and just imagine how the youngsters in your family will go for Christmas tree ornaments they can actually eat. Yes, like grown-ups, the kids really look forward to some extra special eating pleasure at Christmas time. The kind of mellow, deep-down eating enjoyment you always find in all Henry's mouth-watering blend of thick, rich fudge, smooth, buttery caramel, crisp, fresh-roasted peanuts, and pure, real milk chocolate. So remember, for some special holiday happiness, decorate your Christmas tree with real eating fun. That's O. Henry, public energy number one. Thank you. Now back to our true detective mystery. <laughs> the country, Joseph. I uh, know. That's why I took you out here. It's so... so like heaven, I think. With you, it is. <laughs> a penny for your thought. Oh, no. They're worth much more than that. You have a good business head. I bet you've saved a lot of money. Not too much. I spend a lot on clothes. I like to look nice. You do? But you must have something put aside for a rainy day. A little. I have a wonderful position with Mrs. Leslie Brown as a lady's maid. Oh, all this chatter is a lot of nonsense. You know what I really want to say, Gertrude. No. Yes, you do. You know I love you, Gertrude. How soon can you marry me? I could marry you right away. Because I love you too, Joseph. That's fine, Gertrude. Let's get married tomorrow. No, wait. Listen to me. I think we should wait until spring to make sure that we really love each other. I don't have to wait. But anything my little Gertrude says is fine with me. We'll be married in the spring. I'm going to Germany. But why? What for? What about your job? Things aren't too hot down at the factory now. I think I may be able to make some contacts there that'll help me. When will you be back, Richard? I'm not sure. A few months, maybe longer. But don't worry. I'll see that you and the children are taken care of. And look what I brought you, Father. Here, your gift. Oh, now this you should not have done, my little Gertrude. Bringing yourself and your husband was gift enough for us all. Well, it gave me such pleasure to buy them for you in Altona. <laughs> and Joseph made him have the bill made out to Gertrude Schmidt because he was afraid that if I gave my married name, the news might come out and you would have heard I was married before we arrived. That was very thoughtful of you, Joseph. I'm going to keep the bill as a souvenir of our trip. Years and years from now, it will make me happy. Just to take it out and look at it. <laughs> Let us not look so far into the future. <laughs> uh, perhaps Joseph would like to uh, ski or go on a coasting party. I'm getting along, you know, but I still enjoy them. There's nothing I'd like better, Herr Schmidt. It's the simple things in life that I enjoy. And um, speaking of the simple things, if Gertrude would go out in the kitchen, make us some sandwiches and bring in a beer, Joseph and I have some uh, man talk to do. Certainly, Father. I'll take a long time to do it. <clears throat> First, Joseph, let me say that I'm very happy that my daughter has married a fine man like yourself. Thank you, Herr Schmidt. Now, as to the matter of dowry. Then Gertrude's mother and I are gone. She will inherit everything. You may depend upon that. Why, who thinks such thoughts, Herr Schmidt? Well, they all do, Joseph. And we must face reality. I have a considerable fortune. But since you are in such a fine position, I think it would be better for you to have this inheritance as uh, an, an anchor in case you meet with some misfortune. Do not you? Yes. Yes, of course, uh, Hashman. So I will give you this modest dowry on change my will so that everything I have will be given to Gertrude and her children. Now, <clears throat> here's the check for $375. Thank you, Hashman. I, I won't forget this, I promise you. you and kiss you and hold you and tell you I love you must something be the matter? Oh, no, it isn't that. I thought at first it was because you didn't like my father and mother. But now we're docking back in America 
And you haven't changed. I'm moldy, that's all. But why, darling? We have our life ahead of us. All those beautiful gifts and, and the wonderful police dogs Father gave us. Ah, uh, you can stick what your father gave us in your eye. Oh. Yes, oh, and you can say it again. I thought your father would do better by us than he did. What he gave us was very little. But we've nothing to worry about. You have your position as an architect, and we have plans for our little home, and our future's assured. That's what you think. Joseph, what color shall we make the nursery? There's not going to be any nursery. Why? You don't mean to tell me you don't like children, Joseph. They're too expensive. We haven't the money to support them. Joseph, there must be a nursery. You understand? There must be. All right, Gertrude. Don't get excited about it. Go to our cabin and get fixed up. We're almost done. All right, Joseph. But remember what I said. Mr. Starter, where should I send the trunks and those German police dogs? Oh, yes, Stuart. Uh, glad you asked me. Send the trunks of the dogs to Mrs. Richard Lava, 563 Wabash Avenue, Jersey City. <laughs> I'm tired. Aren't you even interested in seeing the place where we're going to build our home? Of course I am, but this, this forest won't it be expensive to clear away the ground. That's my worry. Come on. Is it much further? I don't know whether I like living so far away from everybody and everything. Can't we even go to look at the ground for our house without you whining, complaining, and nagging every minute? Oh, Joseph. No, and don't call me Joseph. It isn't my name. I, I don't understand why do you talk like that to me, Joseph? I'll tell you what I mean. My name isn't Joseph Strasser, and I'm not your husband. I'm married to another woman. Oh, no. And I have two children. I married you because I was crazy about you. But now I see that you're no different than the ugly women. Please, Joseph, it's not true what you're saying. You're just trying to hurt me. It is true, every word of it. Look at me, and you'll see. No, no. Oh, Joseph, I know that you love me. You still love me because I love you. I'll never love anybody else, Joseph. Please, don't look at me like that. Somehow, 
cremation is just as good as burial. Oh, so they say, these woods are dry as tinder. One or two of these matches. There. That ought to do it. medical examiner says the woman was dead a year. I know. You think someone would have missed her? Someone would have reported her as missing? Maybe someone did. We can't get the name of a skeleton. Well, now, look, Harper, I realize that this is an almost impossible case to crack. The trail isn't only old, it's practically non-existent, but we know it was murder. We sure do, Inspector. A bullet doesn't fall out of the heads of skeletons unless someone shot them. Okay, then let's take a look at the few, few clues that we do have. Yeah, here we are. A watch with the initials G.S. Yeah, uh-huh. And the hand stopped at 12.30. But when? A year ago? What day? Was it 12.30 at night or in the daytime or what day? Well, what did you find, Inspector? You know the regulators on watches, Harper? You mean the little hand that turns to either fast or slow? That's right. This is a German watch. How do you know that? Because on American watches, the hand is turned either to F or S for fast or slow. But in German, it's A and R for accelerando or retardo. But that's not German. I know, but all watches made in Europe are marked that way. Well, an education helps all right, Inspector. But what does that prove? Nothing, only that it's a German watch. So now let's see that scrap of paper we found. All I can figure out that it's a bill of sale. Yes, did you look at it under the ultraviolet light? Sure. Brought out some writing. Eric Schaefer, Altona. Hey, maybe it's spelled wrong and it should be Altona, Pennsylvania. I don't think so, Hopper. Remember the watch. Let's get an atlas and see whether or not there's an Altona in Germany. The atlas showed an Altona in Germany, and I checked with an Altona city director in the library and found there's an Eric Schaefer who runs a store there. Great work. Send him a cable asking if he's made a sale within the past five years to any woman with the initials G.E.S. and who, to his knowledge, had come to America. But isn't that an awful long shot, Inspector? You bet it is, but this whole case is a long shot. Look how far back we're working. Send that cable. Got it. Got it, Inspector. What, Harper? The cable from Eric Schaefer. Here, read what it says. Two years ago, on February 8th, I sold to Fräulein Gertrude Schmidt of Vida a blanket, tea tray, Costco pattern, and breast basket. So, the woman's name was Gertrude Schmidt. Right. I'll go out and get to work on it. Check the missing persons list. And I'm going to send another cable. I'm sorry, Inspector. No Gertrude Schmidt was reported missing. No trace of a Gertrude Schmidt on any of our records. In fact, we can't find a thing on it. Well, don't be so discouraged, Hopper. I've received another cable from Eric Schaffer in Altona. Read it. Adolf Schmidt, father of Gertrude Schmidt, says Gertrude Schmidt married Joseph Strasser and sailed to the United States March 27th on liner Rosencrans, intended to stay at Hotel Renard. You see how that helps? Now we'll cable him for a picture of Strasser. <laughs> What are we looking for down here at the docks, Inspector? Trying to find the man in the shadow, Mr. Joseph Strasser. The hotel clerk at the Renard said they registered there. Sure, but he couldn't remember them, and as usual, Mr. Strasser left no forwarding address. And that's why I told you to try and find a description of the baggage of Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Strasser. And suppose we don't find it. Then what? We'll find it. All we have to do is keep looking. And then? Well, then we'll find out where it was shipped. And maybe, maybe we'll have the address of the husband of Gertrude Schmidt who was so uninterested in his wife's whereabouts that he never reported her missing. And then maybe we'll find this Joseph Strasser, the man in the shadow. Hey, here we are, Inspector. Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Strasser. Wow. Why, wow. Six trunks and two German police dogs. <laughs> they certainly didn't well, travel light, did they? What's the address? Hmm, that's funny. Looks like a dead end, Inspector. Why? Well, I think they must have boarded with some people. Because the stuff was sent to Mrs. Richard Morber, 563 Wabash Avenue, Jersey City. <laughs> Sorry, Inspector. There's something awful fishy going on at the Lorbers, but I can't figure it out. What about Strata? Mrs. Lorber never heard of him. Or of Gertrude Schmidt. She never took in boarders. Lying? No, that's just it. I'd swear she was telling the truth. Well, that knocks my theory into a cocked hat. You were figuring that the Lorbers might have killed their boarder. Yes, but they'd have had to kill them both. Hey, but, Inspector, the darndest thing is there are two German police dogs running around the yard. <laughs> I'm from the Board of Elections. There's been some mix-up about the names of the people living in this house. Uh, is there a Joseph Strasser here? No, and there must be a mix-up. This is the second time people have been asking for him. Well, uh, you see, we'd like to get this straightened out once and for all. Uh, just who does live here? Just me and my husband, Richard Lauber, and our two children. I see. 
I'm sorry to bother you, but uh, do you have a picture of your husband? Why, yes. In the family album. I'll bring it for you. I'd appreciate that. I'll be right back. It's, it's right here on the table in the hall. Now, here it is. Here are several pictures. Isn't my husband a fine-looking man? Yes. Yes, he certainly is. Thank you very much, Mrs. Lava. I'm sorry to bother you. This is John Shuttleworth. In just a moment, we shall hear the amazing end of this crime classic, because although the police felt that they had the murderer, there were still some surprises in store for them. But first, it's time for O. Henry. Say, you hear that Christmas music, Jane? I hear it, Danny. And what's more, I like it. It makes me think of parties and presents, families and friends and feasting. Yes, it's holiday time again. Time to greet old friends and make new ones. Time to remember that a very important part of the Christmas celebration is the pleasure of really good eating. The kind of delicious deep-down eating enjoyment you find in every old Henry candy bar. Yes, for the heartiest kind of holiday treating, there's nothing like that mouth-watering old Henry blend of soft, satisfying fudge, smooth, chewy caramel, crisp, fresh-roasted peanuts, and pure, real milk chocolate. Believe me, all that marvelous flavor adds up to a taste thrill made to measure for any holiday celebration. And remember... Not only Christmas, but every day is merrier with a very top in eating fun. That's O. Henry, public energy number one. Thank you. Now back to our true detective mystery. Anything new, Hilda? Oh, nothing. Except that these men are always bothering me about a joke that's dropped up. What? What did you say? Richard, what's the matter? You don't feel well, do you? What? Men, what what did they want? Oh, I don't know. They were, they were from the Board of Elections. They wanted to see your picture. And you showed it to them? Sure. Was there any harm in that? I... No. No, you... You couldn't know. How could you know? Oh, dear, you are sick. Yes, sick to death, Hilda. Open! Open over there! Who is that? What is it? It's the police. It's all right, Hilda. Let them in. Richard Lauber, alias Joseph Strasser, we arrest you for the murder of Gertrude Schmidt and warn you that anything you say may be used as evidence against me. No, no, you're wrong. I admit I married Gertrude Schmidt. I admit I used the name of Joseph Strasser, but I didn't kill her. Richard, you? No. Now I understand that dream. Take me away. I'm a bigamist, but not a murderer. Take me away. <laughs> you think Lauber killed that woman? As sure as I'm standing here, Inspector. We're going to have a lot of trouble proving anything except bigamy. Yes, I know. Lauber's story about her walking in the woods and being shot by accident by a hunter might just be true. Ah, no, but it isn't. I know it isn't. But how about we've got to have a confession? And I have an idea. Mrs. Lauber gave it to me. Mrs. Lauber? Yes. Take Lauber up to the attic room. Leave him alone there with nothing but a candle and lock the door. What do you think's going to happen? I don't know, but I'm banking on something. Get him up there. <laughs> What are you going to do with me? Why are you putting me in this room? Relax, bud. Just going to sit here and cool off for a while. But I don't like this room. I, I want to go back to my cell. You will. Just sit here for a little while and think. Bye-bye, buddy. Pleasant dreams. Oh, this is nonsense. I have nothing to be afraid of. It's an empty room. I'll just sit down here and wait. No! No, stop it! I, I better walk around and keep talking. That way, I don't think. Don't you, Joseph? Listen. No. No, I will not. I won't listen. Yes. Yes, you will, Joseph. Because what you hear is inside you. You must listen, Joseph. I won't. I won't listen. I don't hear anything. Don't you, Joseph? Listen. Don't you know what that is, Joseph? I, I don't hear anything. I don't hear a thing. It's the check my father gave you. Richard Lauber confessed 
was tried, found guilty, and paid the supreme penalty for his horrible crime. At the trial, a number of startling facts were revealed. Larber was unable to find Gertrude's body when he searched because, as medical evidence established, she had not died immediately, but had stumbled almost half a mile, attempting to get out of the forest before death overtook her. And the most miraculous thing of all was that the bill of sale had not been completely burned because it had been protected by her body. So, once again, it was proved that murder, though it hath no tongue, will cease. Except for the use of fictitious names and places, this was a real story of a real crime solved by real people, with a real criminal brought to justice. But there are still criminals at large, and as editor-in-chief of True Detective magazine, I offer $500 reward for information leading to the capture of Charles Henry Leeper. One month from the date of this broadcast, and as a direct result of listening to this broadcast. Charles Henry Leeper is wanted for investigation in connection with the murder of Frank Rosetto, a Cheyenne, Wyoming taxi driver, on the night of March 5, 1947. The motive is suspected to be robbery, as Rosetto was known to have approximately $200 in his possession. Charles Henry Leeper is 24 years old, 6 feet in height, weighs 180 pounds, has hazel green eyes and brown hair. Leeper has the following marks of identification. Left arm, shorter than right arm, a six-inch scar on upper left arm. If located, notify Sheriff N.E. Tuck, Laramie County, Cheyenne, Wyoming. On no account, call your local radio station, but notify Sheriff N.E. Tuck, Laramie County, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Then get in touch with John Shuttleworth for the $500 reward. Be sure to listen again next week when O'Henry brings you John Shuttleworth with another thrilling dramatization of an actual crime from the pages of True Detective magazine. Read True Detective magazine, the current issue of which is now on the newsstand for your enjoyment. True Detective mysteries are written and directed by Mary Burnett. Music by Paul Taubman. The part of John Shuttleworth is played by Richard Keith. Your announcer is Hugh James. I'm a sense grad. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. It's now 9 o'clock, Venice Watch Time at KECA Los Angeles. Tick-tock, tick-tock, time to shop at your downtown department store, Eastern Columbia Broadway at night. Eastern Columbia Broadway at night. Gift for your home, summer grass scale type planter lamps, just eleven ninety five. Eastern Columbia Broadway at night. Open evenings from now till Christmas Eve. <laughs> The political season is upon us, and those flying the red collars have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.
2000 plus. Adventures in the world of tomorrow. Dramatic stories of the years beyond 2000 A.D. Today, a story of the world of 2000 plus 60. A story called Alone. I listened to my footsteps as I walked down the long corridor. Just my footsteps. For the first time in so many months. No nurses, no doctors, no burly attendants at my side. I was walking alone. I was well. I knew who I was, and where I was, and what I was going to do. I walked past the photoelectric cell that operates the huge bronze doors. Out into the brilliant sunshine. And down the road leading toward my laboratory in the heart of Nuclear City. I passed up the hospital limousine service. I wanted to walk. To breathe in the air of freedom, to drink in the sunshine, the peace of the quiet countryside. I walked slowly because I realized that all too soon I would be engulfed by the noise and the tumult of the Earth's top research center. And finally, I reached the city proper. I started up the broad avenue lined with laboratories. And then suddenly... Something was wrong. Terribly wrong. I stopped a moment and listened. And then I realized what was wrong. Not a sound. On this avenue, normally bursting with activity, with the whine and groan of machinery and the roar and rumble of nuclear bombardment, there was nothing. Not a sound. Not a voice, not a soul, not a single solitary human being. <laughs> For a moment, a wave of panic swept over me. How would you feel in my place? They had taught me well at the hospital. I fought it off in my mind, but my feet hadn't been psychoanalyzed. They began to go faster and faster through the streets and down the alleys, looking, searching for some sign of life. A cat. I stumbled up the two steps and flung open the door. Hey. Hey, anybody here? There was nobody in the shop. It was empty. Only the sound of that cat yowling in the back room. I stepped over to the door, separating us. All right. All right, Kitty, take it easy. I'll let you out. Just let me slide this bolt. Ah, here we are. Now, let's see what you look like. Hey, Kitty. Kitty, where are you? Where are you? It was gone. Vanished. One moment, it was scratching furiously and yowling its full head off. The next, it had disappeared. All that was left after that strange hissing noise was a small dark stain on the floor. When something suddenly happens to your nervous system, when you find yourself with trembling fingers and a racing pulse, it's a good idea to do something physical, some familiar mechanical act. There was a pack of cigarettes on the counter of that deserted shop right behind the cash register. I pounced on it eagerly, put a cigarette between my lips, took a quick puff to light it, and then drew in a deep breathful of the comforting smoke. And then I heard it. The sound of a motor, a big motor. I dashed to the door... And it seemed to me that the bus must be terribly close. But it wasn't. It was fully two blocks away. Only the unearthly quiet of Nuclear City made it seem so near. I sprang to the middle of the street, waving my arms wildly, shouting with relief. Hey, driver! Driver, this way! A bus, a 300-seater that would be bringing people, voices, news, news about this terrible silence that had fallen over Nuclear City. It was 150 yards from me now, and my skin began to crawl. There was something wrong. 
Now it was a hundred yards from me, fifty, and still the juggernaut hadn't slowed down or honked or swerved or given any indication that I was blocking its path. At the last split second, I jumped. And then turned to watch it thunder past me, catapult over the pedestrian ramp and smash into the concrete walls of the deep space observation chamber. <laughs> the bus was a tangled mass of twisted steel and lucite. That was all that was left of it. And the people? I forced my way in, through a gaping hole in the side, and thrashed through the wreckage looking for some survivor, straining to hear a cry, a faint moan. There was nothing. From the rear straight through to the driver's seat, there was not a sign of any human being, dead or alive. It was a phantom bus. And the passengers and driver who had sat in it when it started its journey had vanished into thin air. <laughs> I staggered away from the incredible spectacle, my senses reeling. It would take more than a cigarette, more than a familiar mechanical act to quiet the rising terror that was beginning to grip me. I had to find someone quickly or my mind would give way again as it had once before. You, you down there on the street? I shook my head to clear it. Voices, hallucinations... This was one of the first signs of insanity. I remember... Please! But... You! Down there in the street! Look up here! I'm up here at the window! Slowly, I raised my head and looked up. She was there. Framed in the window. A frightened woman with red hair and a desperate urgency in her voice. You! You're real, aren't you? Thank God! I thought I was going mad! What's happened? What's happened to Nuclear City? You are! I bounded for the front door, tried the knob. I'm it. I'm coming down. Don't go away. Please, don't go away. You I go heard away. her fumbling with a bolt. Oh, and at last I had found what someone, someone to talk to. In another moment, I would stand face to face with the first human being I'd seen in three hours. The door swung open. I caught a fleeting glimpse of red hair. And then, shh, that soft, sibilant sound. And after that, Nothing. No voice, no red hair, no woman, nothing. All at once, it dawned on me. I knew now with a dreadful certainty exactly what had happened. My mind had snapped again. No, 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 no not snapped, swerved. Swerved into that strange, rare condition doctors call Duval's Phenomena. There were people on the street, there were voices and sounds in the air, but my sick mind shut them out, refused to acknowledge their existence. A mind that blotted out all living things might lead to anything. I was dangerous. I had to get away while I still had some control of my movements. I began to run. Run, 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 back to one place where I knew I could do no harm. Back to the safe, calm, composed climate of the psychiatric hospital. Once more, the big bronze doors that I thought I would never see again clanged shut behind me. And I walked slowly down the corridor with a feeling of relief as though a heavy weight had been lifted from me. The elevator operator was not at his post, but I knew how to operate the pressure lift. I pressed the button that would take me to my own pavilion on the 36th floor. The therapy room where, just a few short hours ago, I had been playing a four-handed game of galaxies with my fellow patients. I took three eager steps into the room. And then I stopped. For the room was empty. With a strange emptiness, as though time had stood still. There was the table with the cards still laid out, the cigarettes still smoldering into ash. As I snuffed them out, I noticed a chess game in the corner. The same game I had watched Phillips and Maxim start three hours ago. Queen's Gambit declined. Phillips was still a pawn ahead. But Phillips wasn't there. And neither was Maxim. Where were Marquand? And Lester and, and Rosen and Tien Chung... And for air, I stepped out into the hall, 
plugged in the PA relay and frantically tried to get someone. Dr. Frankel. Calling Dr. Frankel. Please acknowledge. Nurse. 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 Hello, hello. Does anyone hear me? Emergency. This is emergency. In the name of heavens, if anyone hears me, please acknowledge. In all that vast space, which was the regional psychiatric hospital, in all the miles of corridors and acres of wards and pavilions, there was no one. No one to hear my voice and acknowledge it. I fled down to the main floor along the silent corridor and out into the open. I jumped into the nearest vehicle, a turbojet that must have dated back to the year 2100 and made for Nuclear City. Something kept nagging at my mind, tugging at the strings of my consciousness, but I shook it off. I I was afraid to think. I I could only keep moving, 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 hoping for... I had no idea what. In the city, nothing had changed. I wandered through the streets slowly, searching for some sign of life, some... I jumped at the six o'clock whistle. In a moment now, tens of thousands of workers should come pouring out of the tall buildings. Shouts, cries, laughter should fill the air. But the whistle only echoed through the empty streets and the traffic lights clicked on and off idiotically in a mad cycle. Red, green, cross, red, green, cross, red, green, cross. Suddenly, a sharp stab of fear knifed through me. I thought of my laboratory, the project. The project I'd been working on when I became ill. Internal organic dispersion. A method of activating the energy within a mass, causing it to burst outward. Something must have gone wrong. My assistants had misread the formula and let the force get out of control. Of course, of course, that could have done it. I must get to the lab at once. A burst of speed brought me to my intersection. I leaped to the escalator onto the high-speed pedestrian ramp. Slidewalk, the kids had called it, when there were kids. And a minute later, I was racing through the familiar twists and turns of the fishing building, pushing through the doors to my own laboratory. Panting, I looked about. Everything appeared to be in order. From far below, I could hear the throbbing of the giant cyclotron and the hum of the huge electromagnetic dynamos, the sharp smell of ozone filled the air. I took a quick glance at the control panel. It showed every machine, every piece of apparatus working perfectly. There was nothing wrong, except the fact that they were working. It was after hours and machines should have been turned off. I switched off the main control. And then... A cold shiver ran down my spine. There was a new sound... A sound I hadn't expected to hear. Someone was coming up the pressure lift. The private lift leading from the cyclotron to my own laboratory. I stood facing the cage. Watching. Waiting. A man stood there. A live man clad in the usual anti-radiation suit. I peered through the glass panel on the headpiece, and then I had to fight to keep hysteria out of my voice. Davis! Davis, it's you! It's really you! Sure, it's me, Chief. How are you, John? Welcome back. We've missed you. Davis, you're all right. You're alive. Of course I'm alive, John. You're the one who's been sick, remember? Davis, how long have you been down there in the cyclotron housing? Two days. A special inspection tour. I'm glad it's over. Uh, help me out of this suit, will you? The buckle's caught. Yes, of course. Of course, that explains it. Explains what? You were shielded when it happened. Hold tight now while I yank. Yeah. Ah, there you are. <clears throat> Thanks. I can manage now. What do you mean that explains it? Explains what? I watched him unbuckle the anti-radiation <laughs> suit. I felt everybody? I should say something. Yes, I, I, I I tried to, but nothing would come. Anyway? Finally, the this, suit was undone. This place looks Davis started looks to step like out of the suit, and finally the I words came past you. my lips. No, no, Davis! Get back! Get back in the suit! It was too late. 
before my very eyes, Davis disappeared. And his anti-radiation suit crumpled to the floor. My legs buckled and I began to tremble all over. I knew my hours were numbered. No mind could stand up under repeated explosive shocks such as I had been through. I staggered to the first aid cabinet for a plasma capsule. And as I tilted my head back to swallow the capsule, the building across the street caught my eye and my pulses leaped. Communications building. Communications, visiphone, long-range telesonic broadcasting. This was it. My opportunity to establish contact with the outside world. I dropped the glass and bottle and capsule and rushed out. <laughs> Two minutes later, I was in the main studio. I plugged in the lines, whirled the sending and receiving controls to maximum range, focused the electronic visiscope camera, and switched on the power. Nuclear City calling all stations. Nuclear City to all stations. Clear wires for disaster report. Emergency. Nuclear City calling all stations. Please acknowledge. I shifted the directional beam. Nuclear City calling St. Louis. Omaha. San Francisco. Guam. Tokyo. Come in, St. Louis. Guam. Tokyo. Come in. Nothing. Not the slightest sign that there was anyone anywhere who could hear the sound of my voice or see my image. I turned off the power and swung away. And a slight movement, a tiny flash of light caught my eye. The turntables, the turntables that recorded every program sent out were still going. Turning round and round and round, wearing deep meaningless grooves in the wax platter. I stepped over to the first table, moved the pickup arm to the start of the record and switched on the playback control. In another moment, I would hear the last sounds that had issued from Nuclear City's communication center. Two days later, Rollo and I reached the great spaceport of New Terra. We had spent a month in the steaming jungles of Venus and had learned many things. We had learned that the flora and fauna... Oh, we... shut up, shut up, shut up! Well, I'll try the next table. Maybe I'll have better luck. And dispatches pouring in from all parts of this sector have confirmed earlier reports that the disaster which has struck Nuclear City is... The disaster is due... That is, the condition is caused by a wave... A wave of... Once again, I heard it. Recorded for posterity. The quick, seething hiss. And the silence. I couldn't stand it any longer. I suddenly went berserk. I began smashing everything in sight. The records, piles and piles of them. The machines, the tubes, everything. Stop. Stop it. You'll hurt yourself. I hardly knew what I was doing. For hours and hours, an explosive force had been building up inside of me. And I first loose. And finally, finally, it spent itself. I calmed down. And heard her voice. That's better. Much better. My name is Bolter. Well, turn around. Look at me. No. No, I, I'm afraid so. You'll vanish. Like the others. Nonsense. I haven't vanished yet. Turn around. You see? Sure. You, you're beautiful. Anyone would look beautiful to you now. Anyone alive. And real. How did you escape it, Volta? Why are we here? We two alone. We must go. We can't remain here any longer. Go. Yes, 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 yes. You're right. We've got to get away from Nuclear City, away from this whole stricken area. But how? There is no transportation. Now, wait, no... wait. My plane. Plane? Yes. Six months ago, before I went into the hospital, I put it up in a small hangar at the spaceport. Six months ago? It wouldn't be any good now. You couldn't possibly get it into the air. We can try. It's our only chance, Volta. Come on, there's no time to lose. <laughs> Do you see anything, Volta? No, John. It's pitch dark out there. No beacons. No clusters of light. Keep trying the audio box. I'll see if I can pick up the landing beam. Calling Chicago. Calling Chicago. Landing instructions requested. I've got the beam. It... No. No, it's gone now. Probably a radar reflection. Move over quickly. Let me try that scanner. 
Chicago. The skyscrapers. The lakefront. The boulevards. What's... What's happened to the lights? What's happened to the airport? It's no use, John. It's reached here, too. We might just as well have stayed in Nuclear City. No, 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 no. We've got to go on. We've got to find someone. I won't believe. I can't believe there's no one left but us. Calling Detroit. Calling Detroit. This is John Rhodes of Nuclear City. John Rhodes calling Detroit. Channel 407. Respond. You're wasting your breath, John. Turn back. I'll never turn back. John Rhodes to Hobbs City. John Rhodes to Hobbs City. Come in, please. Come in, please. Can you hear me? Are you convinced now? Sure, I'm convinced. I'm convinced the stricken area is larger than I thought, but I'm not quitting. Not quitting? What are you doing? Strap on your safety belt and switch on the oxygen control. I'm shifting into nuclear overdrive. Where are we going? The other side of the earth. The spaceport at Rio. Steady now. In less than 40 minutes now, we'll be... What is it? What's wrong? I don't know. Something's happening. A swerving. A swinging around. Some tremendous magnetic force has caught us in its toe. Turn back, John. Turn back before the ship flies apart. I can't, Volta. I can't do anything with a plane. She's out of control. <laughs> I lay there, looking at the clock. I couldn't bring it into sharp focus, but I knew that the number three was slightly chipped, and that when it chimed, there was distinct hesitation between the second and third note. I knew these things because that clock was on the wall of the therapy pavilion on the 36th floor of the psychiatric hospital. Yes, I remember the clock. But how had I gotten here? What had happened to my plane? Where was Walter? Or was any of it real? Had I ever gone down the long corridor? Had I ever really left the hospital? Was the awful experience I had lived through anything more than a very vivid nightmare? And if I screamed now, would a nurse come running? Help! Help! Nurse! It's true, then. Everything really happened. I'm not dreaming. And Walter. What about Walter? I've lost her, too. There's no one left on earth but me. I'll never see another face or hear another voice. I know that now. I will sit here in the silence and wait for the end. Footsteps. Footsteps. Good evening, Mr. Rhodes. I am Dr. Draneth. Dr. Draneth? Do... Do I know you? No, Mr. Rhodes. Not yet. But you will. You will be in my charge from now on. You've been very ill and you're going on a little journey. Here, take this capsule. But I... Take it, Mr. Rhodes. The trip you're about to make is long and difficult. There, that's it. I'll look in again presently. Dr. Drenneth. He took it, Volta. Yes, I believe we chose wisely. John Rhodes is the greatest nuclear physicist on Earth. He will be of inestimable value to us and our people. I think our work here is about finished, Doctor. The final reports have just come in. The molecular diffusion cloud worked perfectly. And according to plan. Those who were not directly affected by the cloud itself were disintegrated by contact with their fellow men. Some died immediately. 
Some seem to have a temporary immunity. Like that woman, Nina, who called to Rhodes from the window. Mm. Poor man. Even though we protected him from the disintegration mist, he apparently was still capable of killing others. But now the chain reaction is complete. There's not a living human being left on Earth, except Rhodes. Perhaps it was wrong, Dr. Drenneth, to destroy these humans. Wrong. They were different from what I had expected. As I guarded John Rhodes, I found him kind and intelligent and courageous. Now I'm beginning to think the whole experiment was cruel. Cruel? I do not understand you, Volta. You're familiar with the history of the planet Earth from the very first pages of recorded time. These Earthmen have bent every effort to kill each other off, to create new and more efficient weapons of death. We merely fulfilled their destiny, but we did it mercifully. The new inhabitants we bring here will be kind, as we are. I suppose you're right. Well, here are my notes on the six hours I spent observing John Rhodes' psychological reactions. You will find them very illuminating. And now, what do we do with him? This last human being left on Earth? What we planned from the beginning, Volta. You may notify our spaceship anchored beyond the magnetic field to send a tender for us. Yes, Dr. Drenner. We and our specially selected Earth specimen are ready for the long journey home. Home to Mars. <laughs> Two Thousand Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions, Incorporated. In tonight's cast, Ralph Bell played John Rhodes, Joan Shea was Volta, Nat Poland was Dr. Dranath, and Carl Eastman was Davis. The script was written by Judith and David Bublik. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Sound, Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner. Engineer, Bob Albrecht. This has been 2000 Plus. Excitingly dramatic stories of the future. These are events that you will never witness. Adventures into the world of tomorrow. Tune in again next week at the same time for another thrilling story. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
first letter seemed harmless enough, possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern, and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre. He's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up by a mad brain. It is a house that calls you, a house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself, if you dare. Weird Darkness Publishing presents Of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly. Now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. From Hollywood, Barry Sullivan in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate. In The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. Sullivan, famous motion picture and stage star in Eavesdropper, a drama of the unexpected. Your name, senor? Ray Madison. That's spelled with two D's. See, si, two D's. Address? New York City, New York, USA. Occupation? Tourist? Mm, I see. If you wish to make a confession, it may save us both time. And uh, trouble. Yeah. Si, senor. Well, all right. What have I got to lose? You must know the whole story by now, anyway. I will call a stenographer. Make it a redhead. The color of the hair does not matter, senor. Here in Elondos, we utilize male stenographers. Pedro. Oh, Pedro, venga pronto. Now, senor Madison. As you say in your native land, sing. Okay, chum. This confession will include a full statement of my connection with the uh, abortive revolution of Colonel Juan Dominga. It will be long and detailed, but you ask for it. I came down to this hot, smelly little country three months ago. Partly because things were too warm in New York, and partly because El Hondos was advertised in the travel posters along Fifth Avenue as a land of opportunity. So for 90 days, I've eaten hot food slept in hot hotels, tried to keep out of the hot sun, and serenaded a Latin woman. It's been very enervating, all that heat. But in spite of the natural attractions of your beautiful little republic, senor, I forced my mind into odious business matters. It's an old North American custom. All right, now let's get this straight, Juan. 
Colonel Domingo, if you please, senor. Oh, sure, I know how you feel. I was a sergeant once myself. <laughs> Pretty amusing. Is it? I didn't think so at the time. But let's get down to business, Colonel. You want 79 machine guns, 2,000 rounds of... Senor, please. This is a revolution, you know. You might be overheard. Okay. Now, I have prepared a list of the firearms we shall require. You will please memorize this paper and then destroy it. And in, shall we say, three weeks, my needs will be satisfied. Maybe, if you don't need too much. And if the price is right. I'm the middleman in this deal, you know, senor. And I wouldn't like to be left in the middle. You'll be well rewarded, amigo. When I assume the duties of government. If you don't mind, Colonel, I'd like something in advance. You never can tell how an election will turn out. In El Andos, one can predict if one is well equipped. Maybe, but I'd like 5,000 on account. Very well, senor. When the arrangements are complete, you'll receive your money. Uh, dollars, Colonel, not pesos. <laughs> Domingo pulled his chest up out of his stomach, clicked his heels, bowed, and strode off down the street. A cluster of beggars at the far end of the square gave him a wide berth. Colonel Domingo wasn't likely to be voted the most popular man in El Hondos unless he had a 105-millimeter howitzer pointed at the ballot box. But he had friends. He wanted to influence people, and what was most important to me, possessed a very full cash box. Three weeks later, I had contacted some uh, specialists in the homeland. I always buy American. They agreed to forward a shipment of thunder sticks to be carefully mislabeled canned peaches. I anticipated prompt arrival aboard the SS Night Rose, which was scheduled to drop anchor in a sheltered cove belonging to the current president's current girlfriend. The lady in question, Dolores, was already anticipating a political upheaval and spent her spare time practicing the gentle art of waxing mustaches. So I was ready for my 5,000 bucks. Colonel Domingo was ready for his guns. The president's girlfriend was ready for a change of administration. And El Hondos was more than ready for a grade one class B revolution. When is this, Senor Madison? Colonel. I trust I have not kept you waiting, amigo. Oh, no, the pleasure was all mine. I've just been sitting here drinking my tequila and enjoying the view. <laughs> the pretty girls at the fountain with the jugs of water on their head, no? Yeah, they have such extraordinary um, equilibrium. Equilibrium? <laughs> Let it go. Now, let's get down to business, Colonel. Shh, not here, on the patio. There might be eavesdroppers. Ah, there's nobody important around. This cafe is as empty as a burlesque theater after a raid. Very well. But caution is the watchword. Remember. I remember. And I may as well tell you, if anything happens, the fact that you are an American citizen will afford no protection. The official police do not look for their passports until they are certain that a corpse is a corpse. Yeah, but in any case, I'd like to think that the body had $5,000 just for funeral expenses. The high cost of dying, you know? Please. Not joke, senor. In my country, nobody jokes about 5,000 bucks. When the arrangements are complete, you will have the money. That's what I'm here to tell you. Everything's all set. The boat docks tomorrow evening. Here, I've got a telegram. Here. Here, read it. But I do not understand. Peaches are machine guns. Apricots, there are rifles. Candy jams are ammunition. And the uh, harmony grits are TNT. Oh, a cold. Yeah, you catch on quick. Then tomorrow at midnight, we will move swiftly from Dolores' plantation to the capital, and the revolt will begin. And there'll be 5,000 bucks for me, if you please. Very well. But, Senor Madison, you have a one-track ma What was that? Look. Huh? What? Look, that beggar. He was sitting down there. He's running away. So what? But he heard us. Do you not understand? He heard oh, everything. Okay, okay. Don't get excited. But he may go to the police. See, he's disappeared around the corner. If he should talk, I am ruined my honor. Do you not realize what it means to lead an unsuccessful revolution? Is a person of disgrace. Well, that's life. Unless he is found and stops our lives are in jeopardy, Senor Madison. That beggar must be prevented from reaching the government officials. I'll take your word for and it. If he isn't captured, I cannot pay you the $5,000. Well, for Pete's sakes, why didn't you say so in the first place? Stop worrying, Colonel. I'll find our eavesdropper. And the revolution can go off on schedule. Domingo waggled his mustache with deep concern, but I didn't wait to listen to him. I'd spotted the little beggar limping across the edge of the square, and I took after him like a sailor on his first shore leave. But I was too late. He'd already been swallowed up in the maze of narrow, twisting streets that fingered their way down toward the waterless Hondas River. That beggar had to be found and silenced. I value my neck as much as the next guy. And although I hadn't informed Colonel Dominga, I realized if that little brown stool pigeon ever reached the police, my life was worth about as much as a duck in the shooting gallery. 
You see, I know that some of these boys take their revolutions kind of serious. In fact, dead serious. So I went in search of my prey. Felipe Roxas, the clerk at the Hotel del Granada, said he knew everybody in El Hondas, and I figured he could be of some help. Yeah, he knew everybody in El Hondas. See, si, senor Madison. I think the man you are looking for is Pedro Gonzalez. See. Si. It must be Pedro. Pedro, thanks. But it could also be Raul Martinez. Martinez. Or Fernando Garcia, or Roberto Hernandez, or uh, Carlos Limon. Or... Felipe was no help. By now, Colonel Dominga and his hopes for revolution had wilted perceptibly. I decided our only chance was for me to wander the streets and turn our little brown friend up before he turned us in. My meanderings led me into every bar, greasy spoon, flop house, and uh, dance pavilion in the capital. I discovered a total of 17 beggars who limped, wore tan sombreros, had big ears and shifty eyes, but none exactly fitted the picture of the little man who overheard my conversation. And then number 18 did. It was just a few minutes ago when I spotted him. He was coming out of a large white building, his flat nosed face wreathed in smiles, and his sombrero cocked at a jaunty angle. I broke several records for the hundred-yard dash as I crossed the street. He saw me, affected a miraculous cure for his limp, and spurred it away like a frightened fawn. But I caught him. What, what do you want, senor? We know the wrong. What senor want? I took a stranglehold in the little guy's throat and was just applying leverage when a guy in uniform burst out of the entrance of the white building, flashing a large black old-fashioned revolver. What is going on here, senor? Uh, not a thing, officers. Just doing my calisthenics. Finger exercises. Great for the muscle tone. Senor, this is unforgivable. Do you not know where you are? This is the police station. Senor, it is no proper place to commit a murder. And you were so right, officer. I relaxed my grip. No sense wasting energy on such a hot day. And besides, my victim had already squealed. He was coming out of the precinct station, not going in. I was the one that was going in, prodded by your large black revolver. As far as I was concerned, Colonel Dominguez's revolution was finished and goodbye 5,000 bucks. You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. for the surprising conclusion of Eavesdropper, starring Barry Sullivan, a Hamilton Whitney production written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt and directed by Frank K. Danzig. Well, that's it. Si, senor. So ends the shortest revolution in the history of El Hondos. You boys will, of course, be able to collect the canned goods when the night rose docks tonight. And now I'd like to see the American consul. Gracias. The Republic of El Hondos is indebted to you for this information. Huh? Why me? That little eavesdropper must have given you the straight dope before this. He told us nothing, senor. Nothing? Then, then what was he doing in the police station? His begging permit needed renewal. And Diego is always prompt. You mean he didn't tell you about the revolution? <laughs> but no, senor. How could he? Hear nothing of your conversation with Colonel Dominga. You see, Diego is deaf. Totally deaf.
Eavesdropper starred Barry Sullivan. Listen soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. This program was transcribed in Hollywood. Dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, got your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. Unsolved Mysteries. Some crimes of murder are mysteries because the murderer, having foreseen every difficulty of avoiding detection, has successfully overcome these difficulties and has therefore actually avoided detection. But there are crimes in which the mystery lies in the manner in which the crime was committed. Such is the case of the Bridge Whist expert, as the New York police termed the slaying of J.B. Maxwell in his apartment 644 West 70th Street, New York City. Since some of the characters are still alive, Names of characters and places have been changed, but the dramatic reenactment is authentic in every detail. The scene is the 600 block West 70th Street, New York. The mailman on his rounds waves to a milkman across the street. Police officer Brown saunters down the sidewalk, and at that moment, a woman walks down the street, up the steps to number 644, takes out a latch key, opens the door, and walks into the apartment as the clock strikes eight. Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Maxwell, I brought you... Tell me, I'll have a look. He, he, he was still breathing when I walked in his room. Well, he's dead now. Drill clean through the head. Oh. What do I call headquarters? Hello? Hello? That phone's out of order. Well, I'll use the one next door. Hey, you, milkman. Instead of standing there, the door gaping. Get on the phone and call headquarters. Okay, I'll get him right away. You haven't touched the body? No, I should say not. Who are you, anyway, his wife? No, he wasn't married. I'm his housekeeper. I, I came in just a few minutes ago. I was going to tell him something. I came in here and found him like this. You were out, huh? You leave the door open when you went out? No, I was just coming in for the day. 
I live at my own home. You found the door locked? Yes. I had to use my key to get in. How many people have keys? Only me and Mr. Maxwell. And yeah? And, well, the lock was changed only last week. Anybody can get in through the back door? There is no back door. There's a basement door. It's the door on the inside. He, Mr. Maxwell must have killed himself. Nobody could have got in. Killed himself and then went out and hid the gun, I suppose. Well, I didn't think about the gun. Anybody here with him last night? Not before I left. Hmm. Maxwell smoked a load of cigarettes? Not that I know of. Well, was this one here on the mantel shelf when you left last night? Been left burning and charred the shelf. It wasn't here when I left. Hmm. Well, this is probably the DA and his investigators. There's something else I don't understand. There's a lot I don't understand. But Mr. Maxwell wore a wig, and, and he had artificial teeth. He was very particular that nobody ever saw him without them. And yet he... Yeah, he... yeah. He doesn't have on his wig, and he doesn't have his teeth in. Where are you all that's the D.A. And here, Mr. Wilson. Uh, what have you uh, found out, officer? Well, he was shot through the head. House was locked. Both doors locked on the inside and no gun. Yeah. He was reading his morning mail when he was shot. Yes, Gary. Who got him his mail? He must have got it himself. Hmm. He was dead when you came in? No, he, he was still breathing. And he could have let the murderer in himself. Yeah, but the murderer couldn't get out. No? Who are you? The milkman. I called you at headquarters. I was in the street to live in milk for 20 minutes and not a soul but the mailman. The mailman? You saw him? Sure. I waved to him. Hmm. How long before this woman, uh, Mrs. Lawson, arrived? Oh, less than five minutes. Now, wait a minute. Let's get this straight. No one has come out of this house since the mailman delivered the mail? No. Then whoever killed Maxwell is still in the house. Sorry, Mr. Carey, but that won't do. I searched the place while you were talking in here, and there's no one in this flat beside us. Yeah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe you didn't see anyone come out of this flat, but someone did. That's that. Well, Mr. Wilson, I was walking my beat, and I would have seen anyone leave. Then he was killed earlier than we think. Oh, no, couldn't he, Gary? He's got the mail in his hand. Oh, yes. I realized that as soon as I spoke. Here's something else to puzzle over. Look at the bullet hole smack in the center of his forehead. Yeah. Yeah, but look where the bullet hit the wall. Can you beat that? Now then, uh, where would a man have to stand in order to fire a shot on that angle? Over about here, sir. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's all right except for one thing. You're standing 15 feet away from Maxwell, and the shot was fired within three feet. See the powder bones? Well, a man would have to be lying down on the floor to fire the shot at that angle and move powder bones. So it would seem. But what was Maxwell doing, waiting for the murderer to take aim? He's got me beat. He's got more than you beat. Uh, Wilson. Yes? I'm going out for a minute. Going to call the phone company. Yes? Yes. I've got an idea. I'll be back in a few minutes. See if you can pick up any more of us. Whoever killed Maxwell must have, well, must have been well known to him. Well, we know that because he admitted the murder himself. Yes, yes have. But more than that, he was particular about his appearance. Mrs. Larson said so. He wouldn't have admitted anybody, that is, anybody he didn't know very well, without first putting on his wig and putting in his artificial teeth. Hmm. So? So the murderer was a man and not a woman. And he was a man from whom Maxwell had no secrets. All good evening, Brown. But it neither gives us a motive nor does it explain how the murderer got out without being seen. Yeah, but Mr. Wilson... It does help to explain how the murderer got close enough to Maxwell to kill him at three feet without arousing his suspicion. You're right, Brown. You're dead right. Your idea at least narrows the field of search down to Maxwell's immediate friends. Oh, uh, here's Carrie. What'd you find out? Plenty. Did you say, Brown, that this phone was out of order this morning? Yes, sir. I tried to use it, and Mrs. Larson said no, I that... I said that the phone had been out of order for several days. Well, listen to this. The phone company's records show a call, an incoming call, the previous morning. Then Maxwell called Rockaway, 1841. And at 6-9, he called a number in Garden City. But you, Mrs. Larson, say that the phone has been out of order for days. I know it has. Because the other day, the chauffeur drove over here instead of phoning because he said the phone wouldn't work. Well, it's beyond me. The fellow shot through the head, apparently makes no effort to fight, must have been shot by someone lying on the floor, doors, both of them bolted, the house under observation for at least 20 minutes, and a man doesn't live that long with a bullet through his brain. Uh, I tell you what. Yeah, what, D.A.? This place has me jittery. Let's go down to headquarters. Send out the fingerprint boys and talk it over down in my office where things like this don't happen. The fingerprint boys went out to the Maxwell flat. They found nothing. No fingerprints but those of the legitimate occupants of the house. The cigarette on the mantel shelf? Uh, the Lotus cigarette meant nothing. The investigators never knew before that the Lotus brand of cigarette was so popular. The DA's remarks about talking it over in the office became a joke to the department because every day, Carey, Brown, the police surgeon, Wilson, and the fingerprint boys collected there to discuss the murder of the bridge whist expert. I tell you, Chief, it was robbery. Oh, rubbish. The man had $500 in bills in his pants pocket. 
$5,000 worth of jewelry lying loose on his bureau. And if it were robbery, how come the thief gets within three feet of him before he plugs him? And I don't care if it's robbery, mayhem, or anything else. That doesn't explain how the murderer got into a locked house, windows bolted, killed a man with a forty-five, but lie on the floor to do it, walks out with a milkman watching, a milkman who swears that no one left the house. Backed up by the policeman on the beach. Yes, and a woman, the housekeeper, who says that the murdered man was breathing when she entered the room. Hey, everybody in the neighborhood seems to have been watching the house, and no one, not a soul, sees the murderer leave. And not a soul hears the shot. What's that you said? Not a soul heard the shot. Oh, gosh. There's the solution, if only we knew how to apply it. Well, what have we missed? Eight o'clock, he's dead. Shot through the brain. Powder burn showed the shot was fired within three feet. Doors locked. Police outside. Milkman outside. Postman brings mail. So we know he was killed after that. Do we? That's it. That's the second puzzling remark you've passed in five minutes. Not a soul heard the shot. And do we? The chance remarks of a policeman on the beat. But they were the answers to the riddle which has haunted New York's police department for 15 years. But we believe that we have an answer. Ladies and gentlemen, the solution for which you have been waiting. The scene is the 600 block West 70th Street. A few minutes before 8, a figure, the mailman, walks down the street and up the steps to number 644, rings the bell. Oh, forgot some mail, did you? I just came to the door a moment ago and got the mail. No, I'm not the mailman. You? You? What on earth is the idea of the disguise? Don't keep me standing here. You got my letter? Yes, I got it. Come in. Come in here. You uh, don't mind if I continue to read my mail? I'm only interested in one letter in your mail. Yes? Yes. Will you give it to me? No, I won't. You know what I said to you yesterday over the phone? Quite well. And I haven't changed my proposition one little bit. Listen, J.B., as a mother, I'll go down on my knees to plead with you. Get up off your knees and forget the melodrama. Look here, J.B., in my handbag... Oh, you little fool, don't touch that gun. Listen, J.B., I'm going to kill you. You idiot, you can't get away with this. Oh, I can. I planned it. Don't move. I'm promising you, if you move, I'll kill you. You asked about my disguise. Now is it clear? No one notices a mailman. And this gun, J.B., you recognize it. My husband, it has a silencer. But you, you, J.B., won't even hear it click. Now the letter. Where is it? Ah, under a chair. I'll leave it. Oh, he, he's not so heavy. The kneeling woman, the moved chair. These were the two things which confused the police when they investigated the acute angle the bullet had made. The mailman's disguise suggested itself to the woman because it was a letter she wished to recover from Maxwell. The mailman's disguise was what confused the witnesses as to the time element. Some of them saw the real mailman, others the murderer in disguise. So, the murderer, partly by luck and partly by planning, had left the New York police another unsolved mystery. Seeking the answer to the riddle, what happens in the unseen realm beyond? With all our science, we're as far from answering that question as man was in the beginning. 
But with the accumulated records of the past, the conviction is borne strongly upon some that there is a link joining us mortals with those who have passed this way before. <laughs> No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows, shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear, shadows which fog the minds of men and women which urge them on into their venture in the dark. Dark Venture. The American Broadcasting Company presents Dark Venture. Written by Larry Marcus, directed by William T. Johnson, and featuring Joan Banks in Elizabeth is Frightened. And now your host for tonight's journey into darkness, John Newland. This is John Newland. Tonight we search through the dark city for Elizabeth. The night is unbroken by stars or moon. There are only the thin, pitiful street lamps, the flashing headlights of an occasional speeding car. The hour is two. The chimes in the gray cathedral boom hollowly in the empty streets. An ambulance races down Main, its red warning light flashing on and off quickly. A newsboy stands on a street corner waiting for the last bus. 
A tall girl in a thin coat hides in the shadows of a cigar store, waiting for nothing at all. But we go on, for we must find Elizabeth down Ardmore Drive. Now the darkness deepens. Now it is a quiet, dignified darkness, draping itself over these fine homes. And now here at last we have reached Elizabeth. This is Elizabeth, tossing and turning in her sleep, in the grip of some terrible dream that will not release her. By the faint moonlight filtering through the curtains, we watch her strange struggle. Her head twisting feverishly from side to side, her fingers clawing at some invisible enemy. And then suddenly the struggle becomes too much. No! No, no! It's only a dream. Everything all right. It's only a dream. You won't hurt me again. Go back to sleep. But I... I can't sleep. Remembering. Yes, yeah, always the same. I can't forget you, Philip. No matter how hard I try. <laughs> I don't know who introduced me to the stranger in town, Philip Bailey. I suppose we were brought together because at 45 he was an eligible widower, and at 28 I was well on my way to being an ineligible old maid. But from the very first I was fascinated by him, by his strange mind. And he was so honest and kind, and I admired him for that. I remember how he spoke of his first wife, Martha. You would have liked Martha, Elizabeth. She was so wonderfully alive... The winter she took sick of pneumonia and died, I simply couldn't believe it. For weeks afterward, every time the doorbell rang, I thought, this will be Martha. I've been dreaming this terrible thing. I've only to throw open the door and she'll be standing there, smiling. A month after we met, Philip asked me to marry him, and I accepted at once. Everyone was happy for me. Everyone agreed it was a good match. Everyone but my housekeeper, Flora. When she heard I was to be married, she let me know how she felt in no uncertain way. I've known you since your mama brought you home in a pink blanket, and I can speak plain, Elizabeth. I think you're making a mistake. How can you say that, Flora? You hardly know Philip. Yeah, got a feeling, that's all. Oh, Flora, a feeling. Well, what do you know about him, Elizabeth? You really know. I know that when I'm with him, I'm very, very happy. He knows that when he's with you, he's within grabbing distance of a lot of money. Oh, Philip was right. Hmm? He warned me that's what people would say, that he was marrying me for my money. Well, I want to show you something, Flora. I have a copy of it right here in my desk. Here. I want you to read this. Hmm? Hmm. Waiver of rights. I, Philip Bailey, do hereby relinquish all rights and claims to all real and personal property of Elizabeth Bronson for the duration of her natural life. How do you like that, Flora? Well, on paper it looks all right. When we returned from our honeymoon, Philip took over the side room on the first floor for his study. He filled it with his books and sealed himself off from everyone for hours. Yet we still had time for dinners in the theater and house parties. One night in our home, Philip met Dr. Davis, who'd been our family physician for many years. And here was the first indication of what was to come. No, Doctor, I don't agree at all. I have found that the most exciting aspect of psychiatry is the brutal and terrifying manner in which one mind can dominate another. You mean hypnosis, Mr. Bailey? Hypnosis, I dislike that word. It smacks of the vaudeville stage. But to me, it's utterly fascinating how I can look into another man's eyes, thrust my will into his very soul, and force him to do my bidding. Of course, but only a quack would use hypnosis that way. A quack? That's I'll see you, right, Dr. Bailey. heavens, it sounds like you two are about ready to start punching each other in the nose. I think I'll be going, Elizabeth. Well, doctor, you were to stay for dinner. I'll let the doctor go, Elizabeth. I don't think he'd enjoy his dinner anyhow. 
But everything really began two days later, in the early evening, with the ringing of the telephone. I'll get it, Lizzie. Hello? Oh, hello, Helen. A bridge game tonight? Well, I'd like to, Helen, but uh, Elizabeth hasn't been feeling too well lately. I feel it. I guess it's just nerves, but she does need rest, you know. Could you excuse her just for tonight? Thanks, Helen, thank you. Goodbye. Philip, why in the world did you tell her I wasn't feeling well? I feel wonderful. All right, I guess I'm just selfish. I don't want you to to go to any bridge game tonight, darling. I want you to stay home with me. I see. Why else would I tell her that, darling? And will that be all, Mrs. Bailey? Mm, Let me see. Razor blades, toothpaste, hand cream. Yes, I guess that's all, Mr. Martin. Okay. Oh, by the way, are those sleeping pills helping you any? Sleeping pills? Those pills your husband picked up for your nerves. My nerves? Yes. But I don't understand. Hmm? Never mind. Are you feeling better these days? Yes. Yes, I'm feeling much better. But of course I told the druggist they were for you, darling. I thought they'd be easier to get that way. Oh, then you really bought them for yourself? Yes. I guess I've been doing too much reading lately. Just haven't been able to sleep so well. Philip, what did you mean, easier to get? It's only a mild sedative. Anyone can buy that medicine. Well, I just didn't want a lot of people gossiping about me. Why make such a big issue out of it, Elizabeth? Why else would I have told the druggist that? Is that you, Flora? Yes, it's me, all right. It's me. Did you get all the groceries for dinner tonight? Yes, I got everything. Oh, I want everything to be just right. It's quite a celebration, you know. Just six months ago today, I met Philip. Hmm. What's the matter, Flora? You feel all right, don't you? Oh, why, of course I feel fine. Oh, more? People stop me on the street to tell me how sorry they are you're feeling so bad, and they hope you'll be better soon. Well, I don't understand that. I don't understand it at all. I'll get the phone. Hello? Hello, is this Mrs. Bailey? Yes. This is Mr. Rossi, the baby. Oh, yes, Mr. Rossi. Are the cakes for tonight ready yet? What's that? What's the matter with you, Mrs. Bailey? I beg your pardon? Well, less than one hour ago, your husband come by to tell me to cancel the order. You're too sick for the party tonight. What? I say less than one hour ago, your husband... I, I heard what you said, Mr. Rossi. Why did you call? Well, I, I forget to tell your husband. I think you should pay for the cakes anyhow. I make them especially for you. I'm not going to sell them to anyone else today, and by tomorrow they'll be stale. Well, will you hold the line a minute? I want to talk to my husband about this. He's in his study. Oh, sure. Too sick for the party tonight. Why is Philip saying such things? Why is he? Yes, one of the... I must see you right away, Philip. I'm coming in. Elizabeth, I've asked you many times not to come into my study. But I want to... I want to ask... Am I being too presumptuous and wanting a place where I can read and think in privacy? Philip, I didn't mean to disturb you, but Mr. Rossi... Who? The baker who was supposed to have prepared our cakes for tonight... Oh. He called saying you canceled the order because I wasn't well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I told him not to bother you. I'm I'm tired of all these parties. I want time to read and be alone, Elizabeth. I couldn't tell him that was the reason for the cancellation, so... Well, I said you were ill. I meant to explain. It slipped my mind. Is that so terrible? No. No, I suppose not. Why else would I have told the baker that, Elizabeth? No, Anne, I'm not really sick. Who told you I was? (laughs) Mr. Rossi, well, I'm perfectly all right. Just a little tired, maybe. But, Francis, I'm all right, really, I am. I know, I know what Anne said, but it's just my nerves, that's all. No, Francis is wrong. I'm not ill. I'm just tired. That's all, Grace. 
Well, I may not sound too well, but I assure you, I assure you, I am all right. Yes, I'll take it easy. Yes, I promise, I promise. What is that husband of yours trying to do, Elizabeth? Why, what do you mean, Flora? You know what he told me this morning? What? He told me to throw your sleeping pills in the furnace. But they never were mine. He bought them for himself. I've just been taking them for the last few nights because all this talk about my health has made me so upset. Yes, I know that. But do you know why he wanted me to throw away the pills? Why? Because, according to him, he was afraid you were thinking of committing suicide. All right, Flora, uh, that'll be enough from you. You can pack up your clothes, Flora. Get out of this house. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Well, I'm not getting out of this house, my, mighty, high and mighty you. Well, you'll Mr. do as I say. Flora, go into the kitchen, please. I want to talk to Mr. Bailey. She's leaving this house, Elizabeth. I'll not let him please, harm you. Please, Flora, please do as I say. Go into the kitchen. The day when he came to this house, that's all I can say. She'll have to leave, darling. I won't allow her to upset you this She's way. not upsetting me, Philip. I'm perfectly all right. Well, of course you are, but you should rest more. You shouldn't allow yourself to become so excited. So darling. much has happened that I can't understand. Why, everyone in town seems to think that I'm practically... Practically on the verge of, of suicide. Elizabeth, what are you saying? You mustn't even think. It's so true. Strange. It's that woman who upset you with her lies. She's got to leave this house, Elizabeth. Flora lived in this house even before I did, Philip. I can't tell her to leave. And my wishes mean nothing? Oh, it's not that. I it's... know the mind and how it works. I know it far better than your doctors. I know you're in peril, that you need rest and quiet. And I won't allow this fishwife to fill your brain with poison. You must make a go, Elizabeth. No. I see. You imagine that she is your wall against all evil. Is that it, Elizabeth? Perhaps she is, Philip. Well, I think you need a lesson. I spent the rest of the day in my room. I, I, I was so confused, I didn't know where to turn. What had happened to me, to Philip, to our marriage? What was going on? Come in. Oh, Flora. I meant to come down and see you. I'm sorry about what happened this afternoon. Philip didn't mean half of what he said. Flora, what's wrong? You look so strange. Flora, answer me. What's wrong? Flora, talk to me. Flora, what are you going to do? <gasps> you slapped me. Have you gone crazy? Flora, come back here. Flora, why did you do this to me? Speak to me. Why did you do this to me? Flora! Flora! I was stunned. I, I couldn't believe what had happened, but I could still feel the sting of her hand. Why had she done this to me? After a while, I found enough courage to go looking for her. She was in the kitchen preparing supper as though nothing had happened. She looked up when I entered. Hello, Elizabeth. You look tired, dear. Flora, why did you do it? You mean, tell that husband of yours what I thought of him? I just That's had to That's not what I mean. Why did you come to my room and... Come to your room? What are you talking about? I've been down in this kitchen all afternoon preparing supper. You're lying, Flora. Now, why should I lie? Honey, what's wrong with you? The only time I left this kitchen was when Mr. Bailey called me into the library to apologize for the way he talked. I took his apology with a grain of salt, I can tell you. Then you weren't in to see me this afternoon? No. Flora, telephone Dr. Davis. Tell him I must see him right away. Then I want you to go over to your sister's house. Stay there till I call you. And when Flora came into your room, how did she look, Elizabeth? Well, I didn't realize it at the time, Dr. Davis, but she walked as though in her sleep. And she told you that she was with your husband before this happened? Yes. Yeah. Then under the circumstances, I'd say Flora was walking in her sleep, a hypnotic sleep. 
Hypnotic sleep? I never mentioned this to you, Elizabeth, but when I first met your husband, I discovered he was a firm believer in hypnosis. But... But what has Philip to gain by doing that to Flora? Oh, I imagine you goaded him into his, his little display of hypnotic power. The real question is, what would he gain by doing that same thing to you? Nothing at all. He couldn't touch my money, if that's what you mean. Mm-hmm. Why, he'd just about have to talk me into killing myself. Doctor. Yes? This morning, he told Flora he was afraid I was going to commit suicide. He started talking to him that I'm moody and nervous, and he... Pardon me. Yes, nurse, what is it? Mr. Bailey is in the waiting room. Oh, no, doctor. What does he want? Oh, he just wants to know when Mrs. Bailey will be ready to go home. He stopped by to pick her up. Doctor. Send Mr. Bailey in. Yes, sir. I don't want to see him. I never want to see him again. Elizabeth, what's happened, darling? Your wife felt ill, so she came to see me, Mr. Bailey. What in the world is wrong with Let's not waste time. There's a train leaving here for the east at 6 o'clock. That's just 30 minutes from now. You'd better buy a ticket for that train. Elizabeth, what's he talking about? I don't understand. I'll help you to understand. Your wife is afraid that you're trying to make her commit suicide. Uh But if everything else fails, you'll use your knowledge of hypnosis to accomplish her death, just as you used it on floor this afternoon. Now, maybe I don't have enough evidence to accuse you of trying to kill her. But if you're not on that six o'clock train, I'll talk to the district attorney. Do you believe this, Elizabeth? Yes. Do you want me to leave? Yes. All right. I'll go. I'll wire you later. You can send my things on to me. Goodbye, Elizabeth. Later, I drove with Dr. Davis to the railway station. And from the parked car, I watched Philip emerge from the station carrying a suitcase and board the waiting train. I waited until the train was gone, and then I telephoned Flora. Well, Flora, he's gone. He's gone for good. Good riddance to bad rubbish, I say. I'll go right over to the house. No, Flora. Hmm? No, you stay with your sister tonight. I'd... I'd rather be alone just for tonight. Maybe that's a good idea. My sister and I were planning to go to the movies. Well, you'll call me in the morning, won't you? Yes, Flora. I'll call you. Afterwards, I had a good dinner. Went to a picture show. It was during the show that I started getting the strangest feeling. Almost a premonition. I couldn't understand it. I thought perhaps it was just the darkness of the theater and the natural reaction of everything that had happened today. I left the theater and wandered around the streets trying to find a reason for not going home. What what was wrong with me? What was I afraid of? And then for no reason that I can explain, I called the railroad station. Hello? I'd like to inquire about the 6 p.m. train, please. You mean for tomorrow night? No, no, the one that left tonight. Yes, what about it? Well, there hasn't been any trouble with it, has there? Trouble? What kind of trouble? I mean, it it wasn't delayed any place along the line or anything like that. Oh, no, no, of course not. That train's 400 miles from here by now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, that was a silly thing to do. And then I did something even more silly. I dialed my own number. What was wrong with me? Who did I expect to answer the phone in that empty house? After a while, I hung up. Then I went outside and took a cab home. I just couldn't sleep. I sat up in bed and turned on the lamp. The clock said 1.35. Perhaps a glass of warm milk would help me relax... I started for the kitchen to prepare it. When I passed Philip's study, I saw the door was half open. Oh, it gave me a start. I hurried over and turned on the light. Study was empty, of course. But all his books were still there. Then I went to the kitchen. I prepared the warm milk and I took it back to my room with me. But the milk didn't help at all. I couldn't sleep. I thought of calling Flora, but I couldn't disturb her at this time of night. And then, a tiny feeling started growing in me. 
As faint as the ticking of a watch. I wanted to go back to Philip's study. The feeling grew, gnawing at me. I wanted to go back to Philip's study. Finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up from my bed and put on my robe and started down the hall. I opened his door again and snapped on the light. I told myself the reason I had come here was to decide what I'd do with this room. I'd destroy every evidence he'd ever lived here. I'd, I'd throw out the bookcases and paper the walls and, and, and change the curtains. I, I went over to his desk. In the top drawer, I found a packet of papers. Letters from Martha, his first wife. Their marriage license. Here was her death certificate. Martha Ellen Bailey. Died August 23rd, 1944. Age 25. Cause of death... Suicide. But he told me she died of pneumonia. No. Martha killed Philip. herself, Elizabeth. Yes, she killed herself, poor dear. And she was so young. I... I, I saw you get on that train. The train makes so many stops, Elizabeth. What are you going to do? Nothing. Not a thing. But I rather imagine your Dr. Davis will be sorry when he finds out that in spite of my going, you killed yourself. No, Philip. But then again, perhaps he'll think you killed yourself because of my going. Out of love, my darling. Why are you doing this? Uh, there are many reasons. The one that you would understand concerns your money, of course. And the fact that it becomes all mine upon your death. I'm getting out of here. No, Elizabeth, wait. You're hurting. You'll not run Let away, me go, please. You'll not run please, away. Please, Philip, please. Look at me, Elizabeth. No. Look at me. No. You'll not Philip. run away. Philip, don't. You'll not run oh. away, Elizabeth. You'll stay here because you want to stay. You want to stay, Elizabeth. You don't want to run away. You want to stay with me. You want to stay with me, Elizabeth. You want to stay with me. You see, I let you go. You could run away if you wanted to, but you no longer desire to run away. You want to stay with me. I... You want to stay I... with me. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? Yes. I want to stay with you. Yes, of course you do. You love me very much. You believe in me. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? I believe in you, Philip. Uh, Elizabeth, this afternoon you told me to go away, that you no longer loved me. Now, kiss me, Elizabeth. Uh, you see... There are no magic words, no secret formula. Merely my mind imposing its will upon yours. <laughs> Elizabeth, in the bottom drawer of my desk, you'll find a gun. Get that gun. That's right. Now come back here to me and give me that gun. You do these things because my mind is stronger than yours, Elizabeth. You would stand here and you would let me kill you if I wanted to. Wouldn't you, Elizabeth? I would stand here and let you kill me. But I do not want to kill you. You take the gun, Elizabeth. That's right. You take the gun. They'll find your finger stiffened around the trigger. 
and I'll return to the town I left. And in the morning, someone will call me and tell me, you killed yourself because I left you. And I will be very unhappy. Take the gun and turn the barrel to your heart, Elizabeth. The gun. Turn it to your heart. Not to me. Elizabeth! Elizabeth. Someone heard the shots and found me standing over Philip's body. I explained that Philip had hypnotized me. And there was no trouble at all, not even a trial, because no one is responsible for their actions in a hypnotic state. And since then, everyone has been so nice to me. Dr. Davis, Flora, my friends. Everyone's been so helpful and understanding. And I'm very grateful. But still, I find it so hard to sleep. Because always I wonder, does everybody truly believe that when I killed Philip, I was actually hypnotized? Yes, Elizabeth has trouble sleeping. And when she finally falls asleep, her dreams are far worse than any insomnia. Because no matter how many times she tells herself that Philip deserved to die, she still remains a victim of her own guilt. Maybe we've found our moral that deep within each of us is a pathetic longing to do only good in this fleeting life. And that no matter how we may ridicule this longing, no matter how we may rebel against it, no matter how it annoys us in this sophisticated world, the goodness remains to torture us when we do evil and to always remind us that we are more than we seem to be, that perhaps we might even be the children of God. And if that thought embarrasses you, well, I rather imagine there are times when it also embarrasses him. Good night, folks. See you next week. Listen next week for another dark venture with John Newland. Featured in tonight's story was Joan Banks as Elizabeth. The others in the cast were Janet Scott, Bonnie Phillips, Jack Petruzzi, and Hans Conrad as Philip. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com.
in the weird circle. again their immortal tale, William Wilson. Aura! Aura! Oh, Charlie Vernon, I thought you weren't going to come to my party tonight. Now, this is one party I wouldn't miss for all the cobblestones in New York. <laughs> now, here you're going to announce your engagement to my old buddy, William Wilson. Oh, that was supposed to be a secret until midnight. Who told you? Usual grapevine aura. No secrets in this clubby little group. Now, where is Bill now? In the library. He hates crowds, you know it. Well, he wanted to be alone for a while. What? What was that? Oh, Come on, Aura, let's find out. Well, I think it's in the library, Charles. <laughs> Bill! Bill, darling! He's wanted to get a doctor, somebody. I'll call the doctor right away. What happened, darling? If I were a detective, I'd say he tried to bump himself off and miss. Oh, be quiet, Charles. Oh, Bill. <laughs> it does look like attempted suicide, doesn't it? It's all so strange. It's so strange. Yet... There's nothing strange about this setup, old boy. Gun in your left hand, a bullet hole in your left side. Pretty neat. Are you enjoying it, Charlie? Well, I can't say that I'm not. I came to suffer through your wedding. Who knows, I might stay and enjoy your funeral. Really, Charles, your sense of humor's out of place. You hate me, Charlie, don't you? Boob like you never could stand a guy with brains. Brains? Those muscles in your head are so twisted they look like handcuffs. Why did you do it, Bill? All right, you've got to believe me, I didn't. I didn't do it. Well, who did, Bill, and why? Come on, William Wilson. We want the straight goods for a change. But I didn't, I... You might die, mister. Put your cards on the table. My cards on the table. <laughs> you wouldn't believe me if I told you. None of you would. It all started back in college. When you and I were rooming together at the fraternity house, Charlie. It was one night you were sitting at the desk studying and I was trying to shave. I was peering in the mirror at myself... Why are you getting so slicked up, Bill, old boy? Got a date. With Dolly Maysfield? Cute little something, isn't she? Oh, Bill, she's not your type. Well, she's good for laughs. Well, you don't need laughs every night. What would you suggest? Oh, gee, Bill, if I had your dough, I'd... Well, I'd work hard at college and meet a nice girl and think about getting married. Ouch. I almost cut myself. Oh, I mean it. Go about getting married, Bill. So you mean it. What do you want me to do? Bury myself? Well, no, but... Oh, gee, take, take me, for instance. I know I'm a dope, but I got just enough money to see me through college. Yeah, I know. The $3,000 your old man left you. You're a boob to spend it in this place. You'll wind up with a blank bank account and a dirty piece of parchment to show for your trouble. You've got the wrong slant on life, Bill. I have. Listen, stupid. You've been seeing Aura St. Clair for three years now. She's alive with money. If you'd get on to yourself, you'd spring the question, put her in double wedlock, and get your fingers on that money. I'm in love with Aura, Bill. Love, love, love. Rot. I'd never touch a cent of her money. You're crazy, Charlie. Well, oh boy, I don't want to be late. Hey, hey, Bill. Hmm? Have you met the new boy in the house? What new boy? A freshman just came in today. Sounds fascinating. What about it? Well, nothing, except he's got the same name you have. Are you kidding? No, I just thought you'd be interested. There can't be two William Wilsons. If there is, there won't be for long. Boy, what an ego you have. But great Scott fellow, you waste more time talking than you do anything else. Yeah, which all adds up to the fact that you want me to stay home and study tonight. Nothing doing, Charlie. I got a date with my dolly. Night. That was the first time I ever heard of the other William Wilson. The knowledge that he existed rankled in my soul. That evening, as I stepped out into the hall, 
and walked halfway down the stairs, I was stopped by my double. He looked just like me, or rather like a poor imitation. I felt from the first that he was my evil genius. He didn't act like a freshman when he said, Hello. I've been waiting for you here in the hall. You've been waiting for me? Who are you? I'm your namesake. You can call me Wilson. There's nobody home at the fraternity house except you and me and Charlie. I thought it would be a good chance to get acquainted with you. I'm sorry, I'm busy tonight. Bill. Where do you get that Bill stuff? It might be worthwhile getting acquainted with me. What do you want, anyway? I'll walk you down the stairs. Don't trouble yourself, Wilson. You might be better off never knowing me. I might be, but... Uh... Save it, I said. See you some other time, Wilson. Charles! Oh, Charlie! There's something I can do for you, lady? Oh, yes. I'm I'm Aura Sinclair. I promised to call for Charlie Vernon tonight. Would you call him for me? Well, you're Aura Sinclair. Oh, yes. Well, uh, all right. Oh, uh, would you tell Charlie I'm here? Well, uh, I would if I could, but uh, he's not in. Oh, but he promised he... Imagine him forgetting a date with a nice girl like you. Oh, that's strange. Do you know where he is? Yeah. I mean, well, gee, Miss Sinclair, I don't think I ought to tell you. Is he out with another girl? Well, now that you've guessed it, I guess I'll have to say yes. I see. I'm sorry. I don't look like that. Suppose I see you home. Oh, that's not necessary. It'd be a pleasure. I'd do anything for Charlie. Come on, Bill. Is that you again, Wilson? Yes, it's me, Bill. Don't you think you ought to stick around here this evening? Don't you think you ought to mind your own business? Maybe you are my business. What? Stop ribbing me, fella. I don't like it. Come on, Miss St. Clair. I think you and I will have a lot to talk about. This is awfully nice of you. What? I don't even know your name. Uh, William Wilson. Don't forget that, my sweet. The one and only William Wilson. That's how I met her. We spent the entire evening together, Charlie. We had a lot of laughs. It was well past midnight when we said goodnight to each other. And I was about to go home when I remembered that I hadn't even called Dolly Maysfield to tell her I couldn't make it. Knowing Dolly's temperament, I decided to drop up to her apartment, even though it was late. I knocked on the apartment door. Well, well, well. Look what the breeze brought in, Mr. Heartbreaker. Aren't you uh, going to even ask me in? I ought to never talk to you again, that's what. Who do you think you are, Mr. King of Siam? Oh, that's the way you feel. Oh, wait a minute. Come on in, Bill. I... I've been worried stiff about you. That's more like my doll, baby. Got a kiss for me? Sure. I got a kiss for you. Oh, Bill, I... I love you so much. Come here. There, Dolly. There. Where were you, Bill? Um... Where was I? Don't you trust me, Dolly? Sure, I trust you. I had something important to attend to. Uh, come on, give us a smile. There. I like to see you smile, Dolly. I like it a lot. Oh, I do most anything for you, Bill. I'm glad to hear that, because I've got to ask you a favor. Anything you want. I want you to stay away from me from now on, baby. You and I are through. Through? Oh, Bill, what are you talking about? Don't joke with me. This is no joke. I'm serious. I'm giving it to you right from the shoulder, kid. But you're joking, aren't you? No, I'm not. I found the girl I want to marry. She's class, Dolly, real class, with plenty of money. You get me? He'll never marry her, Bill. She'll find out what a cheap four-flusher you are, Who's and then tell I'll tell her. I'll tell her a lot of things about you. You pretending to have so much money and borrowing from me all the time. Pretending to be such a big shot when you got holes in your shoes. Shooting off your mouth. Shut up. Shut up, Dolly, before I make you shut up. Nobody's going to tell anybody anything. That is, if you're smart. And I think you are. Okay. I know what everybody thinks of me. But I made up my mind to marry Aura, and nobody was going to stop me. I saw Aura every day and every night after that for the next three weeks. Things went according to plan. I thought I was 
rid of Dolly Macefield for good until... Well, you remember that night, Charlie, you and I and Wilson were sitting around the living room of the fraternity house chewing the fat? It was all Wilson's fault. I knew from the first time I saw him he was my evil genius. And you were saying... I just can't understand it, Bill. I've been calling Aura every night, but she won't talk to me. Yeah, that's how women are, Charlie. Why don't you tell him why, Bill? Keep out of this, Wilson. It won't make any difference now. He said, mind your own business. You are my business, Bill. What are you talking about, Wilson? Ask Bill why you never saw Aura the night she was to call for you. Ask him. Go on, Charlie. Bill? Well, what did Bill have to do with it? What difference does that make now? It's all over and done with. Aura's not interested in you anymore, Charlie. She told me so herself. You... You dirty double cross. Sit down, Charlie, and cool off. Why don't you write Aura a letter and tell her the truth, Charlie? Oh, what's the use? But I'll get even with you someday, Bill Wilson. Don't think I won't. I'll answer it. Hey, you make a good doorman, Wilson. I told you, Charlie, to grab the girl while you had the chance. You didn't tell me you were going to stick a knife in my back. The smart guy gets what he wants in this world. Here's William Wilson in. You have to be smart, yes, like me. he's in the living room. Thanks. Bill? Oh, Bill? Well, look who's here. If it isn't the doll baby yourself. Hello, Bill. Hello, Dolly. Meet the boys. This is Charlie Vernon. The doorman is my double, William Wilson. Hello. How do you do? How do you do? Tell you what I'll do for you, Charlie. I'll give you the doll baby here in exchange for Aura. How's that? That's fair. You make a man sick, Bill. Bill. <laughs> Bill, I gotta see you. Well, you see me. How do I look? How alone, I mean. I told you not to bother me anymore. Oh, please, Bill, if you've any pity. Pity? <laughs> sure, I got pity. Where'll we go? Anywhere you say, Bill. How about the river? Hmm? How about a nice walk down to the river? Sure, Bill. That's a good place for what I want. That's just about perfect. Down to the river, Dolly and I. For a talker, she was silent that night. And I knew she had more up her sleeve than her pretty white arm. We got to the edge of the river. We sat down to watch the boats steam by. Bill, I can't live without you. So what? I'm going to give you one last chance, Bill, to be a decent guy. You're going to give me a chance? <laughs> what a laugh. Oh, Bill, don't you know what you're doing to yourself? You're trying to marry a girl that ain't for you. You once told me that you and me was cut from the same piece of cloth. Yeah, I once said a lot of things. We are cut from the same piece of cloth. You're a no-good bum, but I... I love you. Oh, we could help each other. You could go straight and be honest and hide and work right with you every inch of the way. Nobody else would do that for you, Bill. What do you expect me to do? Chuck $20 million into the lake for you? Listen, Dolly, don't try any tricks. Bill, please, please, You don't darling. fit into the picture anymore, don't you get it? Oh, what'll I do? Who cares? Why don't you kill yourself? Make it easier all the way around. You wouldn't care? I'd send you a dozen posies. If I jumped in the river, you wouldn't care? Why should I? Oh, watch me, Bill. I don't think any man's as hard as you pretend to be. So I'm watching. You've held me in your arms. You've kissed me. You've said you loved me. Doesn't that mean anything? It did when I said it, I guess. You can never tell what a guy's going to say. Can you really watch me, Bill? Even though I love you. I can watch anything, baby, when I'm sitting on $20 million. Watch me, Bill. What? Ah, you fool. Jump and get it over with. You can't bluff me. I love you, Bill. Don't forget that. Tully! Help! Help! I can't swim, Bill. Help me! Well, it was your choice, kid. You picked your grave. Now die in it. Nice work, William Wilson. Nice work. What are you doing here? I tried to follow you. I have a feeling I'm a little late. She... 
Wanted to kill herself. I wasn't thinking about Dolly, Bill. I was thinking about you. Don't give me that stuff, Wilson. I don't go for it. I'm always thinking about you, Bill. But you're too smart to allow anybody to help you. And I'm afraid it's too late for you to help yourself. Cut it out, will you? Cut it out. Let me worry about my own soul. If it's damned, then I'll be the one to suffer. Not you. Not you. Dolly was dead. Nobody knew about it except Wilson. I knew he wouldn't tell. At least I thought he wouldn't. I don't know why, but I just knew. And there was only one other person in the way of my plans. That was you, Charlie. You were in the way, and I had to get rid of you. It took me some time to plan the right attack. It was right after mid-years, remember? How could I forget? I was alone in the room with you, Charlie. I was toying with a deck of cards. Stop that shuffling, will you, Bill? I gotta shuffle him. Gonna play some two-handed stud with Wilson. I'm nervous enough waiting for the mid-year report. You'll pass. Don't worry. Well, if I don't pass, what happens to me then? I got $1,000 left. Not enough to pay for any full year's course anywhere in the country. What makes you so sure you flunked? You know why. Still thinking of Aura? Sure, I'm still thinking of her. Day and night. Bill, isn't there a decent chord in you somewhere? Why don't you go to Aura and tell her the truth? <laughs> Why don't you? Hello, Charlie. How are you, Bill? It's about time you got here, Wilson. Sorry, Bill. I hate to keep you waiting. Have a seat. What do you want to play for? Name your own figure. Well, how about a five-dollar limit? Good enough. Want to sit in on a hand, Charlie? No, thanks. I couldn't. Game of stud would be good for you. Take your mind off your troubles. Oh, the stakes are sort of high. Well, maybe you'll win some money. Heaven knows you need it. Okay. Well, I might sit in for a while. Cut for deal, Vernon. It might bring you some luck. Don't you ever lose, Bill? Not very often, old boy. Not very often. Want to bet again? Easy, Charlie. Quit now while you've still got $600 left. Well, I can't quit now. I can't. I, I tell you, I gotta win. I, I gotta. Let's double the stakes. Double it, triple it. Any way you want, Charlie, old boy. Three o'clock, Bill. It's not up to me to quit. I'm the winner. It's up to Charlie. How about it, Charlie? I haven't got much choice, have I? I'm flat busted. Well, that's tough luck, Charlie. That's real tough luck. You've got my girl. You've got my money. You've got everything, haven't you, Bill? Just everything. You shouldn't gamble if you can't afford it. Come on, Charlie. I got that check for the full amount, $1,108. I haven't got that much money in the world, and you know it. Well, give me a 1000 then. I'll take an option on that empty soul of yours for the rest. What's the matter? You going to welch? I don't welch. Where's the pen? There it is, Charlie. Don't get sore. Give it to me. Make it out nice and clear, huh? That's a boy. Here you are. Thanks, Charlie. Where are you going, Charlie? As far away from here as I can get. I'm going to get a job. A good, honest job. Someday I'll be back. And I won't forget you, Bill. I'll never forget you, no matter how long I live. Someday I'm going to get even. Keep your shirt on, Charlie. If you'll pardon me, good <laughs> night. <laughs> nice work, Bill. Keeping an even score. What are you talking about, Wilson? The three aces up your sleeve. And the cards from the bottom of the deck. If you saw me, why didn't you tell him? I don't have to. Other eyes are watching you beside me. Many other eyes. Eyes that keep the records of our lives. So I cheated you, Charlie. You didn't even know it. You left town and it was clear sailing for me. All the way. Yeah, it was clear sailing. Right to the altar. At least almost to the altar. Except for one thing. But you didn't know, Bill. One little thing. I left the fraternity house that night, but I didn't leave town. I went to Aura's house, and I told her the full story. Charlie, this isn't a new story to me. 
All along, I've known Bill's pretty rotten. But I'm in love with him. I'm horribly in love with him. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. I'm fascinated by him. And yet there's something almost appalling about him. He's crude and earthy and... How can I make you understand? I think I understand, Aura. Sometimes I wish I'd never met him. You'd have been better off. And then again, I'd... I'd die without him, Charlie. That's my answer. I'm so sorry, my dear. It's all right, Aura. Someday I'll be back. When you need me. I don't mind being an old shoe for you. I'll be back, and I hope you've gotten over him by then. That was a right touching scene. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you still got a chance, Charlie, if that doctor doesn't get here soon. But you still haven't told me who... Bill, what happened tonight? Well, I graduated from college, and you and I became engaged. And you sent out the invitations to this ball tonight, to all my old friends, even to Wilson, the one man I didn't want to see. I was standing in the ballroom a little while ago, watching you, Aura, when Wilson beckoned to me. He was in the doorway of the library. Somehow or other, I felt drawn to it. I, I, I had to go there, even though I didn't want to. I walked in, closed the door behind me. Hello, Bill. What do you want? You know what I've come for. Why don't you turn on the lights? Are you afraid of the dark, Bill? What are you talking about, Wilson? The world you'll know will be dark forever. Are you trying to threaten me? I don't think I have to threaten you. You threaten yourself by your mere existence. Who are you, anyway, William Wilson? Don't you know, Bill? Stop looking at me that way. Think back, Bill. Think back a long way. Remember, Dolly. I don't want to die, Bill. I just want to threaten you. I don't want to die. I love you. Remember her screams and your laugh? Remember what Charlie said? You'll pay for this someday, Bill. You'll pay for it. I warned you. I've warned you many times. And I never told on you. Do you know why? I don't care why. Think hard, Bill Wilson. Think hard. I'm the only one who knows the truth. I'm the only one who stands between you and success, William Wilson. You carry a gun, don't you, Bill? Don't you? What's the difference if I do? Why don't you kill me? Kill then you? nobody will know. Hate you. Love you. Hate you. Love you. Hate you. Yes, I will kill you. I will. There can only be one, William Wilson. <coughs> There's never been more than one, William Wilson. Uh, I'm wounded. I, uh, I aimed the gun at you. At you, Wilson. Wilson. Wilson! Where are you? Wilson! I'm alone. No, 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 I couldn't have dreamed it. I couldn't, I couldn't. And that's the entire story. You don't have to believe me, but it's the truth. Here's the doctor, Bill. Now, just lie still, son. Don't try to move. I, I don't feel sick, doctor. I'm just stiff, sort of, sort of paralyzed, you know what I mean? Now, let's have a look at this. Hmm. Hey, Doctor, how bad am I? Just lie still. Yeah. Doctor, is he... There's a sudden pain, Doctor. Doctor, I felt fine before, but... Oh, oh. Bill, Bill. I'm afraid it's too late. The bullet lodged near his heart, and the exertion of talking was too much for him. If, if he hadn't talked, Doctor, would he... No, my dear. He must have had a lot on his conscience to have held up this long. William Wilson, I'm waiting for you. Come along, Bill. Wilson, 
What are you doing here? Just waiting for you, Bill. Waiting so that two halves of a soul can be reunited. Come along, Bill. Take my hand. Your hand. So dark here, Wilson. So very dark. Yes. I'll have to lead you. And we've a long journey here, Bill. An awfully long journey. On the road back. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought to you William Wilson. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. I get a terrible feeling of depression, and then this awful urge comes upon me. The urge to hurt someone. The urge to inflict pain. The urge to kill. Another Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales. Many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you tonight the unusual tale, The Urge to Kill. Henry Drake sits in his big office staring out over the smoking stacks of his busy factory. 
production is at its peak. The demands of the past year have brought untold problems to his desk and placed heavy loads on his shoulders. Henry Drake and his partner, Philip Putnam, had started this factory five years ago and built it into a smooth-running, highly profitable organization. But now the added demands of war have more than trebled the production and the worries as well. Phil had put up most of the money and Henry the brains. It was Henry who always had to make the decisions. But now something is happening to Henry. He is beginning to slip. His memory is playing tricks on him. Good morning, Mr. Drake. Oh, Good morning, Ethel. Mr. Putnam wants to know if you studied those contracts last night. Contracts? What contracts? Why, the ones he gave you last night. You said you'd take them home. They must be signed by noon. Contracts? Why, I don't know what you're talking about. When did Phil give me any contracts? Why, just before you left last evening. Well, that's funny. Don't you remember? What? Remember? Well... Yes, yes, I, I, I do remember now. Yes, yes, of course. Well, may I have them? Well, I'll, let me see. What on earth did I do with them? Oh, uh, tell Mr. Putnam to step in here. Yes, Mr. Drake. Mr. Drake would like to see you, Mr. Putnam. I'll be right in. I'll ring if I need you, Ethel. All right. Good morning, Henry. What's up? Why, about those contracts you gave me yesterday evening... Just what were they about? What? What do you mean? Haven't you read them? No. No, I haven't. Good heavens, man. They were supposed to be signed by noon today, and it's 10 o'clock now. Now, where are they? I don't know where they are, Phil. I, I can't find them. I'm sure I didn't take them home. Oh, you must have. Strange. I can't remember a thing about them. Well, what did you do after you left here? Where'd you go? Why, well, I went home. That is, I think I did. Think you did? What's the matter with you, Henry? I don't know, Phil. I can't seem to recall a thing I did last evening. Are you kidding? Certainly not. Why should I kid about such a thing? Well, don't get sore about it. It's certainly ridiculous. This is a serious situation. I know, Phil. I know that better than you do. Well, call your home. They've got to be there. Have Rita send them over by special messenger. Yes, sir. Get Mrs. Drake on the phone. You know, it looked very well, Henry. You're as pale as a ghost. Look at the perspiration. What's wrong with you, man? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I feel terrible, and my eyes are bothering me. Bright flashes keep passing in front of me, and my ears throb. Oh, hello? Oh, Rita, this is Phil. Henry brought a contract home to study last evening. Look around and see if you can find it, hmm? Yeah, it's very important. In a blue binder, about 20 pages. What? I see. Thanks. She's in the library now. Oh. Yes? You can't? Yes. I see. Really? Well, all right. Now, call me back. Well, what about it? You have no idea what happened to you after you left here last evening at six? Did I leave at six? Certainly. So did I. She said you didn't come home for dinner. She decided to go to the opera. And when she came back at 12, you didn't come in until 1. She said your shoes and trousers were all covered with mud. You went straight to bed. Was it raining last night? Of course it was. I don't remember that. Rita's going to look in the coat and suit you were wearing last night. She'll call me back. What on earth is happening to me? Where could I have gone? Yes? Yes, Rita. Well, you couldn't. I see. Very well, thanks. Goodbye. Not a trace of the contract. Now what? Phil, Phil, I've got to tell you this. This isn't the first time this has happened. It's been going on for weeks. About twice every week a terrible depression comes over me, and then when I wake up I can't for the life of me remember what happened the night before. Well, maybe the strain has been too much. You better see a doctor at once, Henry. Oh, I know I should, but I'm, I'm afraid to. Why? I, I'm afraid of what he might tell me. Oh, nonsense. Go and see a doctor right now. I'll go down to your place and search it from top to bottom. Very well, Phil. I'll, I'll go now. I'll be back as soon as I can. Henry stumbles in a daze from his office and walks about the city for an hour trying to make up his mind to see a doctor. He doesn't have the courage to tell his own doctor, so he finally decides to visit a psychiatrist. 
Then he remembers the name of one of the most famous in the country, Dr. Schultz, the state psychiatrist. I know you're not a general practitioner, Dr. Schultz. As a state psychiatrist, I know you're a busy man, but I've read a few of your books, and I thought you'd be willing to help me. Well, ordinarily I wouldn't, Mr. Drake, but I know who you are and what you've been doing. I'll do what I can. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, You say you have lapses of memory? Yes. I wake up in the morning and can't remember what happened the night before. In the morning I have headaches and see strange flashes before my eyes and hear throbbing noises. Uh, How often does this occur? About twice a week. But I remember everything I do during the day. Mm Hmm. Have you ever had a serious ailment? No. Ever had an accident? Anything that might have caused a concussion? Well, not that I remember. I may have had as a child. Hmm. Have you been working under an exceptional mental strain? Yes. Yes, I have. The pressure's been more than doubled. For the last year, the problems have been so heavy that I've been unable to sleep. I've studied them until dawn, until finally I was unable to remember them. Hmm. You don't go to sleep easily. No, not till very late. From all appearances, I wander about until one o'clock in the morning. Where, I don't know. Hmm. You're married? Yes. What does your wife think of your strange behavior? Well, naturally she doesn't like it. She says I walk in and go to bed without saying a word. So now she doesn't even ask where I've been. Uh, Are you and your wife incompatible? Well, somewhat. Have you ever been interested in another woman? I have not. Uh, Any children? No. Hmm. Have you ever been caught in a predicament where you were forced to do something dishonest in order to escape a severe penalty? What do you mean? Well, uh, I'll put it another way. Do you fear anything or anybody? No. Do you hate anything or anybody? Yes. Lately, I dislike my work, my business, intensely. Why? I don't know why. Maybe I've had too much of it. Hmm. Who is uh, closest uh, to you in your work? Well, I... I have a partner, and we have a secretary. And who are they? My partner is Philip Putnam. My secretary is Ethel Watson. Oh, you both have the same secretary? Yes. That way we keep things more orderly. Mm-hmm. Could you get along without her? Oh, I never thought of it. She's very capable, but I suppose I could get along without her. Hmm. Does your partner have as much responsibility in the business as you? I do most of the mental work. You resent that? You mean, do, do I think he should take more responsibility? Yes, I do. But he isn't capable. He plays golf and takes days off at a time. Yes, I do resent that. I know nothing can be done about it. Is your partner married? No. For a while, I thought he and our secretary were growing fond of each other, but in the last few months, it seems to have cooled. Hmm. Are your financial affairs in order? Exceptionally so. Never better. Are you worried about the outcome of the war? No, no more than anyone else. I realize it'll keep every nose to the grindstone. And you drink? Oh, I'm temperate. Probably a little more of late. Never took narcotics. No, no. I've tried sleeping tablets, but they did me no good. I see. Uh, Have you anything further to add to this discussion? I? No. Then I must ask you to leave and not come back. What? Why, what do you mean, Doctor? Just that. Leave and don't come back until you decide to tell me the truth. But, But I've been telling you everything I know. No, you haven't. There's something you've been withholding. Good day. Wait a minute. What are you trying to say? I'm not trying to say anything. I've told you that you're holding something back, some fear that you don't want known. But if you want me to help you, you'll have to divulge everything. All right. I thought maybe you could help me without my telling, but... All right. I'll tell you what it is. That's better. It happens on these mornings when I fail to remember what has occurred the night before. It happens during these spells of flashes and noises. What happens? I get this terrible feeling of depression. And then slowly, gradually, the urge comes to me. The urge to what? The urge to hurt someone. The urge to inflict pain, inflict injury on someone. On whom? Anyone, any person who comes into my mind, anyone I see or think about, the waitress in the cafe, my secretary, my chauffeur, my wife, my partner, a laborer, anyone. Have you ever killed anyone, Drake? No, no, I swear never, and I don't want to. And that's why I'm here. I'm afraid, afraid of myself. I don't want to harm anyone. I'd rather die. Would you? Yes. All right. Now you know. That's my great fear. Something's got to be done about it. You've got to help me. Very well, Drake. I'm glad you finally told me. Now I know what to do. Know where to start. You... You don't think I'm going completely to pieces? 
Mentally, I mean. No, I don't think so. You think it's just temporary? Uh, let's not talk about it anymore. But what can I do? I want you to stay away from the business for a week. Don't go near it. Don't think about it. I want you to stay in bed as much as possible. Read something in the light vein. Put her about, if you like, in the garden, say. Anything but business. At the end of the week, I want to see you again. But above all, rest. Rest your mind and your body. Yes, I understand. And you think you'll... You think that will bring me out of these spells? I think everything will turn out for the best. Oh, thank you, Dr. Schultz. I appreciate all this, and I'll, I'll see you in a week. Goodbye, Mr. Drake. Hey, Miss Burton. Yes, Dr. Schultz. Did you take down that interview, Miss Burton? Yes, Doctor. I made a recording of it. Thank you. So Henry goes home and stays in bed for three days, according to the doctor's instructions. Then, toward midnight of the third evening, his wife Rita comes home and is startled to find him gone. Jackson? Jackson? Oh, uh, yes, Mrs. Drake. Jackson, where's Mr. Drake? Why, Mr. Drake is in his room. But he isn't. He's gone. Gone? But I didn't see him go out, ma'am. When did you see him last? Why, it was uh, about 9.30. I looked in to see if there was anything he wanted before I retired. What did he say? Was he dressed? No, ma'am. He was in bed. He, he said he didn't want anything and that... I might as well turn in. Where on earth could he have gone on a rainy night like this? Well, shall I go out and try to find him, ma'am? No. No, never mind, Jackson. You can go back to bed. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hmm. Can't imagine why on earth he'd go out when he wasn't feeling well. Hello? Phil? This is Rita. I just came in and Henry isn't here. I don't know. The butler said he saw him at 9.30 and he was in bed. Why would he go out in a storm? What reason could he possibly have? No, I don't think so. I hope he doesn't. Yes. Good night, Phil. Yes, I'll see you tomorrow evening, if possible. Good night. As Rita hangs up the receiver, she suddenly realizes the library door is closed, but a streak of light shows beneath it. She steps quickly to the door and opens it softly. Henry. Huh? What are you doing here? Oh, hello, Rita. Why aren't you in bed? In bed? Why, I don't know. Who are you phoning? Phoning? Oh, I was just thinking about phoning the doctor. I wanted to talk to him. At this hour of the night? It's 12 o'clock. 12? Yes, yeah, so it is. Wait till morning. Yes, yes. Anyway, I can't remember what I wanted to say to him. Where have you been? Where have I been? I haven't been anyplace. But you must have. Look at your top coat. It's soaking wet. And look at your shoes. They're muddy. That's strange. I don't remember having gone out. I thought I'd been sitting right here all evening. But it's obvious that you haven't been here all evening. You have been out. Perhaps so. This is the second or third time you've come in with your shoes all muddy. Where do you go at this time of night? I tell you, I don't remember. I don't believe you. Whether you do or not, I don't remember where I've been. It's the silliest thing I ever heard of. A man like you. An intelligent man. Walking around in his sleep. But I couldn't have been asleep. I know that much. Nonsense. Oh, don't be so impatient, Rita. I don't like this any more than you do, but I'm sure I'll be all right in a short time. Dr. Schultz will pull me out of it. Well, I hope so. Have you been out, Rita? Why, of course. I told you early in the evening I was going to play bridge with the Parkers. Oh, perhaps you did, but I don't remember that either. I told you just the same. Oh, I'm sorry, Rita. I know this must be very trying for you... It isn't very pleasant to have a man mope about the house all the time. Better go to bed, Henry, and get off those wet clothes. Oh, yes. Rita, why don't you go away for a few days, take a little rest? I know you're terribly upset about all this, and well, it would do you good. It wouldn't be exactly right for me to go away at a time like this. What would people think of me? Oh, who cares what people think? You go up to the mountains or down to Miami or... Well, any place. Maybe by the time you come back, I'll be all right. Do you want me to go? Oh, I don't want you to go, but I think it would be good for you. You're becoming upset because of me, and I, I think you'd worry less if you got away for a few days. Very well. Perhaps you're right. We'll talk about it in the morning. All right. Good night, Rita. Good night. Henry 
sits for a while, staring at the telephone, then gets up slowly and shuffles up the steps to his room. He pauses for a few moments before Rita's door, then goes on to his own room and goes to bed. The storm continues in its fury, and from his kennel in the backyard, Duke Rita's Airedale begins to howl. <laughs> Finally, the storm subsides. Morning comes, and Henry joins Rita at breakfast. What's the matter, Henry? You haven't eaten a bite. No. I'm not hungry. I don't feel at all well this morning. You do look pale. I... I've never seen you so haggard. No? What's the matter with your hands? My hands? Well, yes. You, you, you keep staring at them and flexing your fingers. Oh. Well, I don't know. You seem to... Well, it feels like rheumatism. Have some coffee. Yes, yes, I believe I will. Here you are. <laughs> oh, good oh. heaven. All over the floor. Oh, I'm sorry. I just seem to have no grip. It's getting bad. I can't even hold on to a cup. Rita. Rita, what have you decided about that trip? I wish you'd take a few days' vacation. Oh, you sound as though you want to get rid of me. I'm only thinking of you. Very well, if you insist. I'll go up to the mountain place. Maybe it'll do us both some good. Oh, oh, Mrs. Drake! Mrs. Drake! Jackson, what on earth are you so excited about? Something terrible has happened. Terrible? What do you mean? Uh, I don't know how to tell you. It, it's awful. Well, what are you trying to say? It's Duke, your Airedale. Well, what's happened to him? He, he's dead. I just went out to the kennel to unhook his chain, and, and there he was, ma'am. Oh, good heavens. Well, what happened to him? He's been strangled. There he was beside his house, and his tongue sticking way out. Oh, it's awful, ma'am. Strangled? But why? Who would... Well, maybe he got tangled up in his chain, but it didn't appear so, ma'am. Somebody did it deliberately. Oh, the poor fellow. I, I can't imagine such a thing. Wait a minute, Rita. I wouldn't go out there. Oh, but I must. Please don't. It'll just upset you. Please don't go. Very well. But... Oh, I'm, I'm just sick all over. Oh, no, no, Rita. I know how you <laughs> feel, and it's a shame. Jackson, tell the maid to pack Mrs. Drake's things. She's going to the mountains for a few days. <laughs> Henry Drake sits staring at his hands for a few moments, opening and closing them, opening and closing them. Then suddenly he leaves the house and rushes to Dr. Schultz's office. What is wrong with you, Drake? You weren't to come here today after tomorrow. I had to see a doctor. Something terrible has happened. No, 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 no. Just calm down, calm down, take it easy. Sit down, Drake. It happened in the night. What happened? You, my wife's dog, he was killed last night. Killed? Well, how did that happen? He was strangled, choked to death. Well, who did it? It... I must have done it. You? Oh, come now. What makes you think that? I can't remember a thing about it. I can remember nothing of last night, but I must have done it because of my hands. What's wrong with your hands? They hurt. The muscles are terribly sore as though I'd been doing something strenuous. I see. And look at this mark on my thumb. It's a long cut as though something sharp had dragged across it. You mean like a tooth? Yes. Why not? A dog's tooth. Hmm. Certainly does. You really think you killed the dog? What do you think, Doctor? Well, I suppose it's possible. But there's no proof. Could be coincidental. I don't think so. I must have done it. He never disturbed the neighbors that I know of. Did you like the dog? I, of course, I was very fond of him. Don't you see what this means? I've been afraid of something like this. Heaven knows what else I've done when I've been in these lapses. You've got to do something for me. Drake, I'm going to have to put you through all the tests. It'll take some time... But I think we can get at the root of your trouble. I'll do anything, anything you say. We'll start right now. Uh, Miss Burden, get Dr. Fenton. I want him to assist me in a complete examination. Yes, Dr. Schultz. Now, Drake, just relax and continue staring into this little beam of light. We want you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Yes. You're crossing a street. An automobile suddenly bears down upon you, you see? Yes. In an effort to save yourself, you jump out of the way. Yes. You jump forward or backward? Why, backward? Why? I can jump backward quicker than I can forward. Repeat after me as rapidly as possible. One, two, three, five, six, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine. 
You have no children? No. But you are married? Yes. Suppose you had a child. You come home at night and discover your house is on fire. Your wife and child are alone, asleep on the second floor. Will you try to rescue them first or call the fire department? I, uh, call the fire department? I see. Get all that with the timing, Miss Burton? Yes, doctor. Now, Drake, keep your eyes on the black dot. Follow it closely as it moves. I'm going to call out a series of words. As I call them, you will answer the word or phrase suggested by what I say. Yes. Green. Grass. Roses. Funeral. Orange. Sunset. Honeysuckle. Home. Violets. Wife. Red. Blood. Dog. Hands. Auto. Wreck. Rain. Mud. Love. Hate. Very well, Drake. Uh, rest for ten minutes and we'll proceed to the next test. Uh, how do your hands feel? Huh? Oh, uh, I about the same. All right. Uh, come with me, Miss Burton. So on through the day, at various intervals, the psychiatrist continues his examination. And finally, Drake goes home completely exhausted. For an hour or two, he dozes in the library. And about 9.30, Jackson, the butler, steps into the room. Big, big pardon, sir. Huh? Oh, oh, where have you been, Jackson? Why, no one was here, sir. I went over to visit my brother for a few hours. Where's Mrs. Drake? Why, uh, she's going to Miami for a few days, sir. Said to tell you she thought uh, she'd better go today. Took the six o'clock train this evening. Oh, I see. Anything you want, sir? No, no, you, you can turn in if you like. Yes, thank you, sir. Good night. All right. Henry sits staring into the dark for almost an hour. Then slowly he rises, as if in a daze, puts on his hat and coat, slips out of the house, and starts to walk about in the night. Finally, he comes to an apartment house, climbs to the top floor, and knocks on the door. Henry, what are you doing here? I want to talk to you, Phil. Well, come in. What's the matter with you? Sit down. I don't want to sit down. Well, just as you like. What do you want to talk about? You have your bags packed. Are you going someplace? Why, uh, yes. I'm driving down to Boston for a week on business. On business? Yes, on business. I tried to reach you today, but was unable to. What on earth's wrong with you? What are you staring at? You sure you're going to Boston? Certainly I'm sure. <laughs> what are you laughing about? You aren't going to Boston. I know where you're going. I tell you, I'm going to Boston. I don't believe you. What are you talking about? Rita's gone to Miami. Why don't you go to Miami, too? Wouldn't you like that better? I think that'd be very jolly. Oh, for heaven's sake, stop this nonsense. Is Rita here? Certainly not. Why should she be here? I wonder. <laughs> Couldn't you think of any reason? I think you're out of your mind. Do you? Really? You certainly act like it. Oh, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm perfectly sane. Oh, crazy people think they're sane. Maybe I am crazy, but I don't feel crazy. I'm perfectly normal. <laughs> you better go home. You're in no condition to be wandering around. Where's Rita? I don't know where Rita is. She hasn't been here? No. You're lying, Phil. She has been here. That's ridiculous. Look. Here in the ashtray, one of Rita's special made cigarettes. Why, I put that there. I thought I'd try them. Really? When did you take to using lipstick, Phil? All right. She was here, but she left to catch a train at six o'clock. And you'll catch the next one, is that it? She came here to talk about you. She's terribly upset about your condition. She thinks... Well. Well? What does she think? She's become afraid of you. Oh, has she? And what caused that? Well, she... Why wouldn't she be upset? You've been acting like a lunatic. She thinks you killed her dog. Did you? I don't remember. Maybe I did. <laughs> I, uh, I've got to hurry. My train leaves in half an hour. There's no train for Boston for three hours, but the train to Miami leaves in half an hour. You'd better go home, Henry. Why don't you admit it? Why lie about it? You're meeting her in Miami. Get out of here. You and Rita are in love. I know it. I've known it for weeks and weeks. Last night I found out for sure. You're crazy. Maybe I am. But I heard you both talking on the phone. She didn't know I was listening in on the extension in the library. I heard you agree to meet at a certain time. That's what I've been waiting for. Now I know. All right, all right. What of it? Well, you've been acting is enough to make any woman dislike you. Oh, so you admit it. Yes. Now get out of here. <laughs> Henry, put away that gun. All right. 
I'm going to leave it right here when I'm through with it. I'm going to kill you. You insane fool. You can't get away with a thing like this. You can't prove anything about Rita and me. They'll hang you. I don't think so. Don't you remember? <laughs> I'm crazy. I'll fix you. Police department. Go ahead. Call them. That's fine. Hello? <laughs> this is Phil Putnam, Rexley Apartments. There's a madman in my room. She's trying to kill me. He's crazy. <laughs> What a shame, Phil. You've missed the train. Well, it's all over, Henry. You can sit down now and wait for the police. You won't have any more mental lapses now, will you, Henry? You won't need to. <laughs> a slick job, Henry, and very beautifully planned. Everyone knows about your mental lapses, your illness, your desire to harm people... Rita knows about the dog. Your secretary knows about the contracts. And most important of all, Dr. Schultz knows that you've been suffering from a mental disorder for weeks. <laughs> oh, there'll be a trial. Your plea will be insanity. You'll go away for a while. And then all of a sudden you'll be cured and walk out a free man. <laughs> now we're in the courtroom. Dr. Schultz, the psychiatrist, is speaking. Mr. Drake came to me with his trouble some weeks ago. Later, Dr. Fenton and I psychoanalyzed him thoroughly. Here is a signed statement of our findings at that time, attached to our findings as of yesterday. Henry Drake was then and is now absolutely sane. The whole thing was a plan to escape the death penalty for premeditated murder. <laughs> well, there you go, Henry. The whole thing blew up in your face. A beautiful plan gone haywire. You should have spent less time thinking about your revenge, Henry, and more time studying psychology. Too bad. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production is composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, 9.15... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the strange story of... Death in the Morning. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Strange Wills Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William And featuring Loreen Tuttle and Perry Ward With Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast And the original music of Del Castillo I devise and bequeath to my heirs The Seven Deadly Sins Hate, 
despair, envy, pride, anger, lust, and jealousy. And here is our well-known star of stage, screen, and radio, Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills, last wills of strange people, so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons, living or dead. Names, places, and time have all been changed. From the yellowed pages of the probate files, we bring you unquestioned proof that truth is still stranger than fantasy. You'll see what I mean in just a moment, but first, here is a brief message from your announcer. And here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Midnight on the Moor. Have you ever walked along the moors of Scotland at midnight when the fog, thick blue fog, swirls out of the ground and covers you like the shroud that covers the dead? Through the blanket of fog you can hear sounds of eerie night creatures that bring fear of things unseen, fear of the bog that carry the reward of slow, agonizing death. In the heart of this moor country is the quaint little village of Perth. I'd never heard of Perth before the moment I'd decided to stop over the night on my way to Stonehaven. The little inn seemed bright and cheerful, the proprietor friendly, and <laughs> I was tired. But news, I learned, travels just as fast in Perth as in any American community. Somewhere along the wee hours of the night, Yes? Uh, yes? Well, just a moment. Mr. O'Connell, I hate to awaken you at this hour of the morning, but you have a visitor. A visitor? But I don't know anyone. Well, just a minute, please. I'll be right out. Now then, Angus, you say I have a visitor? Aye, Mr. O'Connell. It's the Mistress McClanahan. She's from the McClanahan Castle over in the moors. Where is she, Angus? In the palace, sir. Uh, but please, sir, be careful. People shy clear of the McClanahans in the castle. Why is that, Angus? Five years ago, there was a tragedy. Young Moffat McClanahan disappeared into the night and the fog, and he was never found. And ever since, people tell us strange noises coming from the moors around the old castle. It's haunted, they say. How very entertaining, Angus. Show me to the lady, please. Aye, hey, sir. This way, sir. I beg of you to come with me, Mr. O'Connell. My father is in desperate need of help. He must write his will. But, Mistress McLennan, I'm not a barrister. I have not the right I to... know, I know. But there are no lawyers, no barristers in all of Perth. Please come, sir. Very well, young lady. I'll dress and be with you in a moment. I'll do everything I can to help. In just a matter of minutes, I rejoined Anne, and together we started on our trip to the castle, ten miles inland. Her horse seemed to know just where to go. I can't see a thing. Is the fog always as thick as this? Aye. Around Perth, as soon as the sun goes down, the fog comes out of the ground. It keeps people indoors at night. They're afraid. I, I love it. If I didn't know that the hounds of the Baskervilles were purely fiction, I'd almost... Wild dogs. Moor dogs. People seldom see them. 
They run only at night and disappear at a daybreak. Well, they sound depressing. There's an old superstition that they draw people into the box. A slow, silent death to those unfortunate enough to... Good heavens, can't you tell? Don't you know where they are? No, Mr. O'Connell. Until you make one false step. And then as you try to lift one foot, you get caught with the other. And then slowly, slowly you sink. Sink deeper and deeper. Well, I certainly hope your horse doesn't. Oh, get no, off the road. he knows the way. But heaven help the stranger who walks the moors alone at night when the fog comes down. I'd simply say, Anne, heaven help the stranger. And that includes an American lawyer by the name of John Francis O'Connell. I agree, Mr. <laughs> O'Connell. Yes, I agree. Heaven help you. What? I knew then what it means to have that get-out-and-walk-home feeling. The fog was so thick I could barely see my hand in front of my face. Nor was that all. We were going through the bogs, slimy, bottomless sinkholes. And here I was, riding next to a young girl, who asked that heaven help me. And as I listened to the strange sounds all around us, I agreed. And look over there. It looks like a blue haze coming out of the fog. You see it? Oh, yes, we're getting near the castle, Mr. O'Connell. That light has been burning from the tower every night. Every night since my little brother Moffat disappeared. Father lights it to let him know where the castle lies. Angus McPherson, the proprietor of the inn, told me there'd been a tragedy. Would you tell me about it? Of course, sir. It's common knowledge. You see, it happened five years ago. There isn't much anyone knows. Moffat and I had adjoining bedrooms. Sometime around one o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by a noise in Moffat's room. Moffat! Moffat! What was that noise? Moffat! Are you all right? Ah! Father! Father, help! Help! Anne, Anne, why are you screaming? What's the trouble? Moffat! Moffat! Cry out! Moffat! He's gone. Moffat is gone. And nothing was found? No clue? Nothing. Next morning, Father took a searching party through the moors. They found footsteps leading into a bog. But that was all. Well, here we are at the castle, sir. I'll take you right up to Father. Then, if you can find my hand, I'll help you down. Oh, thank you. Now then, just take hold of my coattail and follow me. My life is only a question of hours, Mr. O'Connell. That is why I sent for you. You must help me either to find my missing son or, or bring his murderer to bay. I couldn't rest in my grave otherwise. Anything I can do, of course, but uh, I know so little about it. Hey, all of us know so little. A cry in the night, an open window, footprints leading to the bog. But that's not enough, Mr. O'Connell. Moffat McClanahan is the last of a great line. If he dies, so does the illustrious name of McClanahan... A name that meant honor and bravery since 1707. So, Walter, tell me what I can do. I have a plan, but I want no one to hear it but you and I. Where is the last Anne? Why, she went to her room, I believe. Good. Then we can talk as man to man. O'Connell, there are four people who might have kidnapped or murdered my son. The first on the list is my housekeeper, a Miss Grayson. She always thought that my son was a barrier to my marrying her. She came into my service shortly after my wife died almost 15 years ago. She took care of the children, was a splendid mother to them. But she resented Moffat, hated him because she saw that all of my love and affection was centered around him. She's still with you, Sir Walter? Aye. To have discharged her might have meant the death of my son, should he still live. Aye, Mr. O'Connell, you shall meet her in the morning. But be on your guard. She's sly, artful, and, and dangerous. I'll be particularly careful, Sir Walter. 
In there are three others. Two brothers who are in the line of succession from my title and estates, should my son be dead. And lastly, my nephew Harry, the black sheep of the clan. Uh, he'd sell his soul, that one, for power and a title. I've tried to cry find the criminal for, for five years, but he's always slipped through my fingers. Well, if I can't find the guilty one in my lifetime, then, Mr. O'Connell, I swear I'll do it from my grave. I swear it. <laughs> Yes? I have a breakfast tray for you, sir. Oh, yes. One moment, please. Now then, come in. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm Miss Grierson, sir. The housekeeper of the McClanahan Castle. Oh, yes, Miss Grierson. So Walter mentioned you last night. He did, eh? That's more than he's ever done to my face. He complimented you highly. It's not time for him to be complimenting anyone. Him with a black angel hovering over his bed. How is Sir Walter this morning? <laughs> you can't kill a Scotsman that easy, Mr. O'Connell. He's enjoying a hearty breakfast in bed. Same as you. Miss Grierson, this afternoon, if your duties permit, I wish you'd show me around the neighborhood... You see, I'd like to see the bogs. The bogs? The bogs, Mr. O'Connell? Oh, no. No. I never go near the bogs. They hold death. A black, treacherous death. No one who falls in ever escapes. That's why Master Moffat is gone, sir. He died in the bogs. Aye, he died in the box. What makes you think so, Miss Grierson? I know. I saw footprints leading right up to the bog. And not is, sir. Not is. Hmm. What were the footprints like? I remember them just as plainly as the morning I saw them. Bare feet they were, sir. You could see where the toes squelched down into the edge of the bog. But you have no proof that those feet belonged to the abductor of Master McClanahan. No proof at all. But I know. I know. I heard the moor dogs barking from the bogs for weeks. They were there by the bog, waiting, waiting. Oh! Oh, Mr. O'Connell! Miss Grierson, I just came from Father's room. He's... he's dead. The death of Sir Walter McClanahan made it necessary for me to start out for Perth immediately to carry out the plan that we had worked out the night of my arrival. Anne arranged that I could have the use of the same horse and carriage that had brought me to the castle the preceding night. At least I felt secure, knowing that should I by chance be forced to return after sundown, the horse would bring me back safely. Arriving in Perth, I went directly to the inn. Well, Mr. O'Connell, welcome back to Perth. I uh, trust you had a pleasant night out in the moors. The moors were terrifying, Angus. But this morning, Sir Walter McClanahan died and I must notify his heirs at law to be present for the reading of his will tomorrow night. Aye, Sir Walter did. That'll bring out the vultures, his brothers and his nephew. They've been waiting for years to get that castle. Aye, Mr. O'Connell, there's not a gentleman in the lot. There's bad blood in the McClanahan line. There is murderous blood, I call it. Trust no one, Mr. O'Connell. No one, if you value your life. Part two of Midnight on the Moor will follow in just a moment.
And here again is Warren William. By the time I had reached all the heirs at law of the deceased, made the necessary arrangements with the minister, and taken care of other prearranged matters, it was sundown. The fog was already coming in off the moors in heavy swirls, blotting out everything from sight. It was after dark as I started my return trip to the castle. I gave the horse a free rein and hoped for the best. I thought of a lot of places I'd rather have been at night than on the moors. Fog. Fog and cold. Cut it with a knife. Are you still there, boy? Want to come back here with me? (sighs) Once upon a midnight, really, while I pondered, pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there, there came a tapping, tapping as a... Ooh! Well, what's that? Whoa, oh boy. Whoa. Someone there? Hello! Hello! Is someone calling? Where are you? Over here. I'm over here. Just a minute. Stay right here, boy. I'll be right back. Hello there. Whoa, boy! Whoa! Whoa, come back here! Come back here! Whoa, boy, whoa! Here I am. <laughs> that voice. I know that voice. I heard the gallop of the horse flying away in the far distance. I was trapped. Trapped by the murderer of Moffat McClanahan. I got down on my knees and felt round for the little road that I'd been on a moment before, but it was gone. I was utterly lost. Ahead lay the slow death of the bogs. But I had to go on. I had to get back to the castle. I knew now the murderer of Moffat McClanahan... Step by step, each one could be my last. Then once more I heard the voice. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Oh, I was trapped. I tried to raise my foot, but the other one sank deeper into the mire. It was as if... A great suction pump was pulling me down, down into the very bowels of the earth. Help! Help! I'm sinking down into the fog, into the bog. Help! Help! Rock 
local ages cliff for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flood be a sin the double cure see from wrath and make me Dear brethren, we are all gathered here this night at the Castle McClanahan in the last tribute to the late departed Sir Walter McClanahan. In Mr. O'Connell's absence, I will take upon myself as Minister of the Gospel the duty of reading the will. According to the wishes of the late deceased Sir Walter McClanahan, the coffin is to be opened and his heirs at law will respectfully take seats around the coffin. Will you please wheel in the remains? Aye, right here in this room. Yeah, that's fine, lad, thank you. And now then, will you please remove the cover? Sit it right over near the fire, please. With the five of you, please draw your chairs up to the foot of the coffin. Oh, how ghastly. Must we sit here and look into his dead face? It was his wish, Mr. Son. He was a peculiar one, my brother Walter was. Ever since that night when Moffat disappeared into the fog. Uncle Andrew, must you bring that? I'm sorry, lassie. I cannot help but think of that night. It made of him a madman. He always said that he would find the murderer of his son before he was laid to rest. This is his last chance. His last chance. Now that we are all properly seated according to the wishes of the departed... I shall continue with services in the reading of the will. <clears throat> to my heirs at law, one of you is a murderer. One of you is responsible for the death of my only beloved son. But be not secure in your perfidy. Your sin will find you out. My title and estate must under the law pass on to my oldest brother, Andrew McClanahan. Should he confess to the murder of my son, Moffat? Ah! He's setting up! He's setting up! Sir Walter McClanahan is arising from the dead. He's pointing his finger right... Ah! Stop her! Stop her! She's breaking away! Let me be! Let me be! Or I shall kill... Kill all of you! Yes! Yes, it was I! I who killed Moffat, my own brother. And for a good reason, too. No love was ever given me, only to him. I was jealous, hurt. I carried him to the bog. I threw him in. And then I came back, got into bed, and screamed. <laughs> and now I shall join Mr. O'Connell and Marvin. You'll not find me there, Anne. Your plan to destroy me failed. You, you two back from dead? 
No, Anne. Not back from the dead. Back from the living. To help trap a murderer. Try and trap me. All of you. I dare you. I dare you. <laughs> Stop her. Stop her. Stop her. She's running out to the bogs. Nothing can save her. Anne. And stop! May God have mercy on her soul. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you the rest of the story of Midnight on the Moor. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now, here again is Warren William. How did I come to suspect Anne? Well, when I left for Perth, only two people knew I was going. Anne and Miss Grierson. I knew from my conversation with the housekeeper that she feared the bogs, even in daylight. But Anne was a strange creature. She knew and loved the bogs as well as her father. When she lured me away from the carriage and I walked into the bog, I did so intentionally. I wanted her to think I was dead. The next night, I called on an old actor friend of Sir Walter's to help me. Under the cover of darkness, we slipped into the castle, and a few minutes later, the actor became the dead image of Sir Walter McClenaghan. Well, you know the rest. Under the eerie candlelight of the room, Sir Walter McClenaghan came to life to point a finger of doom at a lovely young girl in whose heart was the deadly sin of jealousy. <laughs> Next week, I have a beautiful story to tell you. A young man was given the opportunity of inheriting an industrial empire or a ticket to Paris. This young man wanted to study art more than anything in the world, but he knew that if he chose Paris, he would not only suffer privation and want, but he would also lose the love of his beautiful, young, and rich fiancée. What did he do? Well, listen to the story which we call... Seven Flights to Glory for the answer. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crepine and produced by Albert Ulrich. This is a Tellaways feature produced in Hollywood. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. The Witch's Tale Destination of the Eerie. Weird, blood chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting, waiting for you. Now. Seventeen year 
old would I be today? <laughs> yes, sir, a hundred and seventeen year old. <laughs> well, Satan, let's get down to our yarn spinning. <laughs> Come on now, douse out them lights so we'll have it nice and dark. <laughs> and draw up to the fire so that you can gaze into the embers. You'll need a fire to warm your blood as <laughs> you listen to this pretty tale. <laughs> You gaze into the embers deep, and soon you'll see a big railway depot in the town of London, England. <laughs> you hear them funny little engines the English people got? <laughs> soon you'll see a funny little coach, like the ones they pulled behind them. And soon you'll hear our yarn about the puzzle. <laughs> the puzzle! <laughs> Everything's stowed away, sir, and the guard has assured me, Mr. Holmes, that you'll have the compartment of yourself, sir, all the way to theory. Oh, that's just bully. <laughs> this uh, chauffeur of yours is a born fixer, Cecil. Yes. <laughs> you know, since I first came to England, I've learned to appreciate the privacy of your railway compartment system. And today, I take it, you're especially appreciative. The chap who's on his way to meet the parents of his prospective bride for the first time will want privacy... Uh, for the examination of his conscience. <laughs> <laughs> Our Julia has much respect for her stepmother's opinion. <laughs> I really have only my future father-in-law to worry about. <laughs> you know, it's funny you haven't heard of him. I'm told he's one of the most successful attorneys in London. Well, his name's vaguely familiar. Omeroy. Omeroy. Yeah, Theodore Omeroy. Firm of Omeroy and Hardy. Now, is there any other claim to fame? Well, uh, <laughs> Julia tells me he's a puzzle expert. Puzzle expert? Yeah, you know, puzzles are his hobby. Oh, you mean he solves those uh, crossword thingy-bobs and plays with those wire and steel? <laughs> what do you call them, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it. My word. <laughs> well, let's be walking towards the train, sir. Very well. Lead the way, Colin. Uh, yes, sir. I'm Dash. Sorry you won't stand for the next train, Willis. We've only had these few minutes together since you arrived from Dover. Oh, I can't stay over. But it was awfully good of you to meet me here for this brief get-together. Oh, I had to hear more of the wonderful girl you've been writing me about. You met her in France? Yeah. Oh, deucedly romantic. You from USA and she from England go to France to find each other. <laughs> well, the poet says, two shall be born a whole wide world apart. <laughs> oh, oh, the man is in love. He's even quoting poetry. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have got it pretty badly. Well, here's a train. Nearly ready to stop. Uh, I'm very anxious to rejoin her. Why did she leave Paris just ahead of you? Our stupid conventions. Julia Chaperone couldn't get away, and she maintained it wasn't proper for engaged people to travel unaccompanied. Oh, I say. I'm sorry I didn't tell the old dodo to go jump in the seine with a Victorian notion. <laughs> Julia shouldn't have made that trip alone. She was too badly upset. Oh, upset? Well, you see, she was called home by a telegram from her stepmother. It was one of those vaguely worded, your presence is required immediately messages. Makes you imagine all sorts of calamities. <laughs> well, Julia decided something had happened to her father. She's uh, very devoted to him. Well, to ease of mind, I called her home by long distance and was told there was no illness there or accident or death. They just wouldn't explain the reason for her summons, though. Well, that only made it more urgent. So when I put her on the train, she was still greatly worried. Sounds rather mysterious. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but whatever the trouble is, it can be very serious. Illness, death, and accident have been definitely ruled out. Oh, boy! Uh-uh, that means me. Uh, which is my compartment, Collins? Uh, right here, sir. Number three. Uh, this is my gentleman guard, which you promised to take care of. Oh, yes. Sit right in, sir. You'll be alone in the compartment all the way, sir. I've arranged for this. Oh, that's fine, guard. Here, uh, thanks very much. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Well, now, in perfect solitude, you can prepare yourself to meet your future father-in-law. <laughs> Too bad you haven't made a study of puzzles, Willis. Then it accepts you as a kindred soul. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I'll have to give that subject a lot of serious thought. Yes, yes. <laughs> Toodaloo, old thing. So long, Cecil. Goodbye, Colin. Boy, Mr. Collins. Best of luck, Willis. Thanks. I, I may need it. Well, I'm off. Oh. Well. A nice young chap, your friend. What? Oh, I beg your pardon. But where... Uh, you weren't in this compartment a moment ago. How did you... A puzzle, uh, isn't it? You really must give serious thought to the subject of puzzles, Mr. Holmes. You know my name? Very well. Now, permit me to tell you mine. I am Theodore Omeroy. You... You're Julia's father? Yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> now I recognize you from the photographs. Oh, this is a pleasure, sir. Excuse me if I don't shake hands. 
I've recently met with a serious injury. An injury? A rather painful one. Although, as you see, I wear no bandages. Uh, was it merely your hand that was injured, sir? You were uh, very pale. As though you had experienced a serious illness. You have been ill. Oh, that's the reason Mrs. Omeroyd sent that telegram to Julia. It was because of me that telegram was sent. But let's not talk about that now, if you don't mind. I prefer a more pleasant subject. I'm very glad to know you, my boy. And I to know you, sir. But uh, how did you know me? Well, that's an easy puzzle to solve. According to my daughter's letters, there can be but one Willis Holmes. <laughs> well, I, I hope I can convince you of that, sir. But the guard said I was to be alone in this compartment. And when he closed the door, I was alone. How on earth did you... I came aboard from the other side. The other side? Yes. You see how simple puzzles are when one has told the answers. <laughs> My gracious... Here yeah, I've been talking of puzzles for a solid hour. I hope you'll forgive me. You see, to me, all life is an endless succession of intricate problems, which the successful man must solve for himself, and which the good man, the man who loves, must solve for others. I wanted you to know my philosophy. And now, I won't bore you any longer. Oh, you haven't bored me at all, sir. I've been intensely interested. Uh, ticket, please, sir. Oh, good Lord, conductor, not again. Sorry to bother you, but it's rules, sir. All right, sir, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, one puzzle I'd wish you'd solve for me, Mr. Omeroyd, is why that conductor never asked to see your ticket. He's looked at mine four times. I ride free, my boy. Are you a stockholder of this road? No. I'm well acquainted with the chairman of its governing board, though. Uh, Mr. Travers. My firm handles his legal business. The last time I rode this train, I carried 50,000 pounds of his money in currency. In currency? Thousand pound notes. <laughs> That's rather dangerous, isn't it? Men have been murdered for a great deal less. It is a dangerous business. But when one is accustomed to handling large sums, one grows careless. Ah, we're pulling into Whitton. I leave you here, my boy. Oh, uh, aren't you going home to Peering, Mr. Omeroyd? Not now. First, I must return to Whitton. That's where Mr. Trazert has his residence. You won't see me again until tomorrow. In the meantime, will you give a little serious thought to the subject of puzzles? I certainly shall, Mr. Omeroyd. But uh, I value your expert opinion as to where and how I'd best begin. Circumstances will indicate your course of thought. Widow! Widow! All right, for Widow! Oh, it's been wonderful Widow. meeting you like this. I was a little worried at the prospect of formally asking you to accept me as your son-in-law. I accept you gladly. You'll look after Julia, won't you? I love your daughter very dearly, sir. Widow. And you will remember that he who loves must solve life's problems for others. <laughs> I must leave you until tomorrow. Uh, again, excuse my hand. The injury I mentioned. Dear me, where's my cigarette case? Uh, cigarette case? I I haven't seen you use one, sir. I'm sure I had it with me. I, I must have dropped it here. Oh, well, I'll look for it and... Just take care of it if you find it. You and Julia, take good care of it. Oh, I, I found it already. It's fallen behind these cushions. Oh, Mr. Omroy. Oh, we're guard. Guard! Hi, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, which way did the gentleman go who was with me in this compartment? A gentleman with you? In this compartment, sir? Of course. He just stepped out. He was standing right beside the door. You must have seen him. This door's been closed, sir, until you opened it yourself just now. You've been alone in this compartment all the way from London. The gentleman we've been expecting has arrived, Mrs. Omeroyd. Mr. Willis Holmes. Well, show him in, Barker, and then inform Miss Julia that he's here. Well, I'll fetch Julia, if you wish, Mrs. Omeroyd. Well, perhaps you'd better, Mr. Toms. You're going to let Julia tell the young man our bad news? Naturally. 
He's her affianced husband at present. You think he'll break the engagement when he learns? Well, then what would you do if you were in his place, Mr. Harley? Mr. Willis Holmes. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Holmes. Julia will be here directly. I am Mrs. Omeroyd. Oh, this is a great pleasure, Mrs. Omeroyd. Uh, Julia has told me so many things about you, I feel I already know you. Hmm. I'll wager she never told you many nice things about me. Agatha, control yourself. Really, I... Uh, allow me to present these gentlemen, Mr. Hardy and Mr. Holmes. How do you do, young man? Mr. Hardy, you're Mr. Omeroyd's partner, I imagine. I'm a junior member of Omeroyd and Hardy. And this is Mr. Justice Rowley, Mr. Holmes. Uh, how do you do, uh, Justice Rowley? <laughs> Justice is a difficult title, isn't it? In America, I believe you would call me judge, although I'm merely a provincial justice of the peace. Uh, Julia will be down directly, Mrs. Omeroyd. Oh, excuse me. Oh, well, this is Mr. Toms, Mr. Holmes. How do you do? Pleasure, old chap. Charms, all that, you know. Uh, Mr. Toms is my husband's personal secretary. Uh, won't you all sit down? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Holmes looks rather uncomfortable. I don't imagine he expected to encounter such a large gathering. Oh, I, uh... Of course he's uncomfortable. Poor chap. Comes to pay a visit to Miss Omeroyd's family and finds the house party in full swing about the place. House party? Huh. Agatha, you must control yourself. I don't understand. Well, there's you. nothing you need to understand, old man. Not now. I'm told you're an American. How do you like England? I have learned to like it very much, Mr. Toms, with uh, some exceptions. Oh, what are they? Well, one is the type of guard employed on your railway train. You don't approve of our railway guards. Well, I've just had a very ridiculous experience with one. A chap either afflicted with blindness or a very faulty sense of humor. It's a rather silly story, but if you care to hear it, I... Willis! Oh, Julia! Oh, Willis, I'm so glad you're here. So glad. Darling, what's the matter? Julia, control yourself. Things are already bad enough, Julia. If you wish to tell him now of our disgrace, at least wait until I can leave the room. Disgrace? What do you mean? Julia, dear, I talked to your father on the train an hour ago, and he didn't mention any trouble here. What did you say? You talked to my father? father? Yes, yes, we traveled from London together as far as Whitham. I don't oh, believe it. He wouldn't have dared. Quiet. Willis. You're sure it was my father? Of course I am. Why, he... Did he say where he was going when he left you? Did he say when he'd be home? Yes. He was on his way to a place called Witham. He said he'd be home tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, thank God. I knew everything would come out all right. That father would come back and explain. Mr. Holmes was mistaken in the man he talked to. Yes, Ormeroy couldn't have traveled on that train as far as Witham. The police would have arrested him before he got aboard. Police? Yes, and if the bobbies missed him... Every guard and conductor on that road has his description. Well, I haven't the faintest idea what any of you are talking about. Though I've never met him before, I've seen his photographs, and I was neither mistaken nor the dupe of an imposter. What did he say to you, Willis, besides the other things you've told us? Well, he talked mostly about puzzles. It was, Father. He's coming home to explain everything. Won't someone please explain to me what all this is about? Uh, perhaps that's my painful duty, Mr. Holmes. Through powerful influence, we've thus far kept the story from the newspapers. But two weeks ago, Theodore Omeroy disappeared. With 50,000 pounds belonging to a client of our firm, a Mr. Travis of Whittam. No indication has been found that Mr. Omeroyd met with accident or foul play. The inference is obvious. And he left me, his wife, to face the scandal. Travis is the man he was on his way to see today. You have been imposed upon. No, it was Father. I know he talked with Father. So do I. And I hardly think, Justice Rowley, that a practical joker would have possessed this cigarette case with Mr. Omeroyd's monogram upon it. Father! Mr. It's Omeroyd's. Where did you get that silver case? From the compartment where he left it, as he alighted from the train. Everything will be explained. He said he'd be home tomorrow. Willis? Yes. Maybe that's him now. Maybe it... Don't be ridiculous. Your father wouldn't ring his own doorbell. If he comes here, the police will bring him as a prisoner. Come in. A police officer is here to see you, Mrs. Omeroy. Oh, they've arrested him. If they have, dear, they'll soon let him go. Show the officer in. Yes, ma'am. I asked to come in on you like this, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Justice Rowley. What is it, ma'am? Speak up. It's bad news, sir. The constables at Whitham have found Mr. Omeroyd, sir. They've arrested him? No, ma'am. They found him dead. Dead? What? Dead? Yes, ma'am. The doctor says he's been dead two weeks. Dead two weeks? Yes, sir. They'll bring his body home first thing tomorrow. His body home tomorrow? Merciful God! What was it that rode with me in that compartment? My dear Holmes, it's been established conclusively that my partner was lying dead in that pit where they found him, 
The very time you insist he was with you on that train. Nevertheless, he or his spirit was with me, as I said. Oh, I know it sounds mad. Impossible. I've always laughed at the tales of the supernatural, just as you're laughing at me now. But I saw Mr. Omeroyd. He talked with me an hour, I tell you. Julia, you at least believe me. I don't know. It's all so horrible. It's too fantastic for anyone to believe. And even if you did see a ghost, Holmes, what purpose did the thing accomplish? Oh, none, I guess. Still, I feel it had a purpose in coming to me. One I can't grasp. Mm, seems to me the traditional storybook phantom would have been of more practical service, Mr. Holmes. They always accuse their murderer. And such an accusation seems the only means by which the killer can ever be brought to justice. We know now that poor Omeroyd was struck down for that large sum of money he carried. But other than that obvious conclusion, we of the law haven't found a single clue. The ghost should have known his murder had left no trail. But instead of dropping a helpful hint, Mr. Holmes says his specter merely talked of puzzles. That would have been my father's way. Julia, you're not going to become a champion of this young man's mad delusion. If your father's spirit could return to Earth, he'd appear to you or to me, rather than to Dantio's fiancé whom he'd never met in life. Father always said, the man who loved solved the problems of others. That's what he said to me. Oh, this is asinine. You've had a dream, my boy. Better forget it. No, for it wasn't a dream. It was real. And it had a purpose. Only I'm too blind to see it. I didn't dream this silver cigarette case. Isn't that tangible proof? I'm afraid that now I must shatter your illusions. I was advised today that the coach in which you traveled from London, by a strange coincidence, was the one in which two weeks before Mr. Romeroy took his fatal journey to Witham. Lying in idleness, the car had not been cleaned carefully. So you found that case where the unfortunate man had mislaid it. Then he returned to put it in my hands. That was his purpose. I see it now. Somehow in this cigarette case is the solution of the puzzle. Well, oh, oh, since you regard the case in that light, perhaps you'd better give it into my keeping as a possible clue for the police. No, I give it to no one. For now I know a guilty conscience has been keener than my wits. A guilty conscience? Are you accusing... I accuse no one yet. Oh, what, what do you mean? mean? I mean that now everyone in this room, at different times with a different excuse has asked me for this case. Let me close this door, Julia. We can then talk in private. Willis, what did you mean by the insinuation you made a moment ago? Exactly what I said. That perhaps a guilty conscience has been keener than my wits. The killer of your father wants this cigarette case. Because he has some reason to be afraid of it. Your father's partner, Hardy, came to me two days ago and requested it as a keepsake. The day before that, Tom's made the same request. Yesterday, your stepmother asked for it, and now Rowley would like to have it. Fortunately, some instinct made me refuse to give it up, even before I guessed it was the solution of my ghastly puzzle. Oh, but your suspicions are terrible. In spite of the frightful way they've acted... Those people were my father's friends. Your father was killed for a sum of money that only his friends or his confidants knew he carried on his person. If I can only solve the puzzle of the cigarette case, I'll learn which one is guilty. His last words to me were, take care of it. You and Julia, take good care of it. Your theory must be right. With father, everything was the foundation of a puzzle. You think there may be a secret compartment in the case? Yes, in which something is hidden. The metal is unnaturally thick on the sides and heavily embossed. There may be a shallow cavity between. Look for a spring or lever hidden in that scroll work. Here I am. Feel around the edges. Maybe something slides. That's or... it. That's it. A sliding edge. Look, I found it. Look. The metal slides are hollow. And there's a folded paper in the recess. What's written on it? It's dated June the 12th. The day your father went to Whittam with that 50,000 pounds. It says... On the understanding that if I have not left England by tomorrow noon, Theodore Omeroyd, to whom I give this writing, will make its contents public. I hereby confess... Confess? To what? Oh, that can wait. Let me see whose name is signed here. Ah! The light! Who turned out those lights? Someone's with us in this room. Arr, let me go! Let me go! No, you won't get this paper! Ah! Help! Oh, Willis. Willis. Is he going 
going to be all right? Of course he is. Coming to now. Nothing wrong but a bump on the head. What happened in this room before you screamed, Julia? Yes, for heaven's sake, what happened? One of you know what happened as well as I do. For one of you came in that door while our backs were turned. One of you turned out these lights. One of you struck Willis, then seized the paper we'd found and ran. And the one of you who did it is the one who killed my father. The girl's insane. Mad. How dare you accuse one of us? Your father's friend. Because one of you is guilty. Oh, not Ron. Julia. Oh, Willis, darling, are you all right now? Yes. Whoever hit me got away with the paper before we saw the name upon it. Yes, they got away. I, I failed your father. When you failed, I may succeed. But my father came to you... Perhaps he'll come again to me. What, what are you doing, Julia? I have locked the one door leading from this room. Why? What have you done? She's turned off the lights. Stop that. Turn on those lights. Oh, I say, you're going too far. No. Only one of you needs the other dark and this locked room. But if my prayer is answered, that one must face the man he killed. Oh, Lord, I pray thee, send my father from the dead to bring justice. Open the door. Turn on these lights. Are you afraid? No, no, I didn't kill him. Father, father, come to me from the grave. This nonsense has gone far enough. Are you afraid? I have no cause to be afraid. Lord, I... send my father here to bring justice. Oh, I'm not going to be made a fool of by a sick-brained girl. Think what you like. I'm going to leave this room. Yes, yes, we'll all leave. Open Arthur, that door. Arthur, come on, quickly. Arthur, turn on the light. Hey, where you are. That voice, Mr. Omeroy. Good heavens. Father, Father, God has let you answer. Some puzzles are too difficult for men to solve alone. No! Let me out of this room! Oh, don't, don't be afraid. That, 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 that's not Omeroy's voice. You see, uh, Holmes and the girl are, are playing a trick upon us in the darkness. No. Something awful here. A hazy light is growing in this room. Omeroid's face is taking shape there. Uh, keep him away. Keep him away. You help us with our puzzle, Rowley. I'll do anything you say. Only don't come near me with your cold, dead hands. Keep away. I'll tell them. I'll confess. But keep away. Rowley. You? Yes. Oh. Yes. I killed him. Tell them why. He learned I'd taken bribes. He made me sign a confession that would send me to prison if I stayed in England. I waited for him on the road to Travis House. I didn't know about the money he had with him. All I wanted was the paper that I didn't find. The paper in that cigarette case that I never found until tonight. Here it is. Use it to send me to the gallows. But don't come near me with your cold, dead hands. Don't come near me with your cold, dead hands. I have the paper. It's confession. You and Tom's hold on to him. I'll phone for the police. Oh, I won't try to get away. There's no escape from the dead. The dead. Father! Father! Willis! His form is fading. Goodbye, Julia. My task is over. We will not meet here again. Father! Julia, dear. Take care of her, my boy. And remember, he who loves must solve the puzzles of life for others. <laughs> well, that's the end of that scene. <laughs> You folks come see us next time I have a birthday. <laughs>
get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.